Okay, good morning, uh, Carroll County. This is uh, Commissioner Ed Rothstein. I'm signing in virtually. Muted. Explain that in just a minute. It is Thursday, February 4th for our open session. Unmuted. We always do each week. Let's stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and then take a moment of uh, silence and reflection on family and friends and keeping always those in emergency services and our health occupation uh, and health services in our thoughts uh, for their strength and courage as we move forward. So with that, let's stand. This conference will now be recorded. Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, for liberty and justice for all. Okay, let me uh, <clears throat> let me kick this off with Priority Carol and explain why I am virtual. <clears throat> because I'm looking for strength, courage, and sanity as I'm stuck in a house. Uh, my son Sam uh, tested positive for COVID-19. He lost his sense of smell and taste. Fortunately, it has come back. My wife Audrey tested positive. I took the rapid test, tested negative, and then took the lab test and again, tested negative. Why that happens, I don't know. Uh, it's very difficult to quarantine within the house, but that's the facts. And uh, so with that said, uh, going by CDC guidelines, I am staying away. Uh, we have not traveled um, outside of the house and uh, we'll get through this, <clears throat> you know, and we'll get through this together. Um, it's almost become a nuisance more than anything at this point, you know, in our house, but, uh, you know, thank goodness for Netflix and puzzles and we're getting a lot of things done. Uh, and then I will finish up prior to Carol, uh, in a minute, but let me send it off to my colleagues. Uh, commissioner Frazier is not with us this morning. Um, and, uh, with that, let's start with commissioner Boucher. Thank you, commissioner Rothstein and, uh, Lord be with you and your family. Hopefully you guys won't drive one another nuts. I see there's little memes like the shining or everyone's locked up. Here we go. Sunday, I was out at the maintenance facility for the roads crew. And this is the administrative staff. They were there Sunday afternoon working hard to make sure that our roads are clear. Uh, I wish I had all their names. Well, there's a view of the uh, Westminster with the snow on it. They did a fantastic job. I believe that we had zero accidents. Correct me if I'm wrong, but when I last checked, the, they did such a wonderful job. There wasn't any accidents on the road because of their service and dedication. And here they are, you know, loading the salt up on the trucks. These guys work 24 hours straight through. I believe uh, Bureau Chief Jim Cook keeps a uh, cot in his office. I don't think people realize the dedication of our crews out there and what they do to keep us all safe. So I give a special thank you to those individuals. Also want to give some uh, recognition to our new hirees in the county. To welcome them aboard. We have Michael Zeckman, Water Distribution Superintendent at Utilities. We have Brendan O'Hara, Road Maintenance Worker Number One. Brent Stanball, Road Maintenance Worker Number One. And Cody Spade, Comprehensive Planner Number One. So welcome aboard, welcome to the family. Also want to give mention of something I've seen in the paper this morning about a recovery program put together in Mount Airy in my district. Yeah, you know, I'll read off a little bit what they said. The need for places where those in recovery from drug and alcohol addiction can feel comfortable and safe and take the time necessary to get their lives in order has only increased because of COVID-19. This is something that my colleagues and I have been very much aware of. And when we see nonprofits like this step up, this place in particular is called Andrea's House for Women and Children in Mount Airy. It welcomes people in who are trying to recover from their addictions Mothers trying to get and stay sober represent an underserved population in our community. The executive director is uh, Carly Summers, and it has come forth from a nonprofit called Rainbow of Love. So if you or someone you know needs help with recovery in that area, please give them a call at 240-409-0450, and it's 240-409-0450. 
And before I close, I'm going to give a special recognition of my party, Carol, to retired Colonel Rothstein. He wrote an editorial this week offering the services for veterans. No one on our board understands this issue more so than Colonel Rothstein. That just because these warriors come back from the front doesn't mean their battle has ended. They are left with emotional scars they have to handle. And so often, as my experience has, when you're dealing with a mental uh, issue, you turn to addiction. So he listed all the resources out there in the community to help you. So if you're a veteran and need help, just like these women and children, please feel free to contact those resources. We are there for you, and there's no shame in confronting your addiction, as I well know. And with that, thank you very much, Governor Rothstein, for the service you provide. Well said, and thank you, Eric. Um, Commissioner Weaver. Well, uh, I don't know if you've looked at the latest edition of the Destination Maryland came out on uh, inside the front cover. Carroll County Tourism has its ad out. We're centrally located. And, uh, uh, great magazine. If uh, you're traveling in Maryland, I think there's 165,000 copies going out. So uh, to our tourism division, I want to say thank you. And last yesterday, I attended the uh, work session for the uh, Board of Education uh, for the operating budget. Um, interesting uh, where they're going, what they're trying to do. And I, I will say uh, they are really trying to deal with remedial education and um, education for our talented and gifted to take it beyond where it is. So I give them a lot of credit. They uh, uh, putting together programs the best they can in a virtual environment. Uh, it's interesting. And it's going to be interesting where I think education goes in the future. Uh, the COVID has brought about changes that we may see um, totally uh, good changes to our educational uh, uh, system in the future. So uh, we'll be talking about this more as we get into the budget, but I just wanted to uh, let people know uh, where they're going. So that's it. Well said. Thanks, Dick. And Commissioner Wentz. I had to zoom in there this morning. I want to I, I like to play with this toy here. So good morning, everybody. Good morning, Carroll County. Uh, I used this word last year and got in big trouble for it. But, you know, I'm going to use it again. I think the groundhog is stupid. So let's just I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, there's absolutely no way that uh, he saw his shadow. Uh, it was it was cloudy and snowing in Pennsylvania. So I'm putting it out there again. The groundhog is stupid. Uh, February is um, Black History Month. And uh, I encourage everyone to, uh, to take some time this month uh, to, to pay attention to uh, the things that, that occurred, uh, not only in the state, uh, but also in Carroll County. Uh, I had the, the, the privilege of taking the Harriet Tubman tour down in Dorchester and some of those counties, and uh, it was uh, it, it was a it was an amazing uh, experience. And if you've never done that, I encourage you to do that. I mean, they they take you to the specific areas uh, where incidents occurred there, and a lot of the events occurred. Uh, but bringing it back home, uh, there is just a ton of history in Carroll County, from the Robert Moton School to to uh, there's a school in in Sykesville. There's a school in my district uh, at Bark Hill, uh, right over by Francis Scott Key High School. And it just doesn't stop there. There's just an amazing amount of, of uh, history in our cemeteries as well. Uh, when you get a chance to dive into the folks that are buried in our cemeteries, uh, it, it's just, and, and what they've accomplished, it, it's just amazing. So take some time this month, uh, make it a point uh, to, to teach your, your, your kids, your grandkids about the tremendous, uh, the, the, the tremendous things that occurred uh, as, it, as it pertains to, to Black History Month. Um, I uh, have been attending many meetings. Uh, we'll go over those. Uh, we've been burning the midnight oil. Uh, I, I stopped and talked to, to uh, our legislative li liaison uh, real quick this morning. And uh, he's as exhausted as I am when it comes to uh, all things Annapolis. It, um, 
it is just unbelievable what's going on down there. And folks have really got to pay attention to the bills. Uh, and we'll talk about that more later on. And finally, I attended my uh, first in a while planning and zoning meeting last night. And it was good to get back with that group uh, to see what's going on there. It's a critical, uh, it's a critical group there because not only are they working on things in the present, but they set the tone for the future of our county. So uh, it, I, I, feel, uh, I, feel, I feel very privileged to be able to sit there with that group again. Uh, they've got a new uh, gentleman on there now from your district, I believe, Commissioner Rothstein, uh, who jumped right in and uh, was in the, in the discussion. So I applaud uh, the folks that are serving there. Uh, with that, I will turn it back over to you. Uh, thanks. And uh, yes, Pete Lester is a great guy. Uh, he's very much uh, involved in the community down in Eldersburg. It's, uh, he asked to be a, a participant on the commission, a member. And uh, so I think we're very fortunate to have uh, a community that cares and a community that stays involved. Um, regarding Tuxedo and Phil, uh, I will say 39% accuracy according to the almanac. So I ain't a big believer of uh, Puxitone Phil uh, personally, so. I know you want to use the word, Ed. I can tell you want to use my word. I'm not Just going go there. Ahead. Good, go nope. ahead. Not going there. <laughs> so, and I am comfortable and uh, uh, Commissioner Boucher, thanks for sharing the, uh, the DPW. We've had multiple calls in preparation for making the decisions uh, on whether the government should stay open, should be delayed. Um, and it all has to do with uh, the skills and expertise that DPW and their entire team provides from uh, the roads, the facilities, the fleet management, the leadership, uh, and everybody engaged. To think about this, and, and you showed the One Slide folks, they were operational nonstop for 56 plus hours. In those 56 plus hours, they covered a total of 8,000 plus or minus uh, miles of roadway to keep us clear. Um, I've seen nothing but positive comments on social media, on uh, you know emails and texts and phone calls about how good our DPW has worked on the roads and uh, and, and the uh, facilities. Um, they compared it to surrounding jurisdictions, and again, I'm just very proud to be a Carroll Countyan. So I appreciate you kicking that off. Uh, Commissioner Boucher. Um, yeah, as, as I mentioned, the COVID-19, it's it's with us. <clears throat> the vaccines we're going to talk about in a few minutes uh, with uh, Ed Singer um, is the two things that I'm really focused on are COVID-19 and DPW right now in the roads in the winter. Uh, we may have some precipitation this weekend. So let's be continue to be prepared. With all of that said, and all the tools that we bring to the table cannot do it any better than with, uh, without you, the community. And your engagement, your involvement means the most. Letting us know what we're doing well, where we need to adjust uh, to make your lives better as a Carroll Countyan is really important. That's our priority as, as a whole. Um, so I, I really am uh, pretty impressed over the last uh, week and the actions we took. Really impressed with what everybody's uh, shared with us uh, this morning as well. Um, Roberta, do you have anything for Priority Carol you wanna share? Uh, just, uh, I agree with uh, two of my, co my commissioners about uh, the groundhog. Um, I figure that uh, whether he sees the shadow or not, we pretty much always have six more weeks of winter from February 2nd on. <laughs> so it's a quaint little tradition and the poor thing gets ripped out of his uh, little hidey <laughs> hole <laughs> in the middle of the winter. He's probably wondering what the heck's going on. But anyway, um, I, we'll, we have six more weeks and we'll enjoy them and, and then we'll be on to spring and, and uh, hopefully uh, nice flowers and, and better weather. So that's it. Yeah. I, I think Phil just wants to go back into his hole, but that's that's me. Uh, I you're picking any, on the ground. Any further uh, state directives um, that we want to share um, at this point, Steve? Uh, no, although I will say uh, that last evening the governor did give his state of the state address, 
And um, <clears throat> if you haven't had a chance to, to, uh, to hear that, I encourage you to do so. Uh, but about 75% of his address last evening did uh, pertain to uh, the pandemic and all of the things that we are accomplishing here in Maryland as a result of that. Uh, so so uh, please go on there and, and, uh, and, and watch that. It actually was about 20, 25 minutes, that's it. And uh, he, he said some very good words on there, so, uh, so do that. Uh, as it pertains to, to any other directives, Ed, I know you've been working very hard uh, you've, you've got another health department or a state call today. At the same time, I'll be on a national call uh, to see what uh, we can expect there. But uh, it might be a good segue here because I believe now we've focused uh, a lot on vaccines and the lack thereof. So um, other than that, I don't think we've heard anything, Ed. No, I appreciate it. And the call you'll be on is with the National Association of Counties, um, which we are participant, actually uh, an active participant in, so I appreciate that. Um, and you got, this is a good segue into, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Eric, did you have something to say? Thank you. Real quick, I just want to add on and show appreciation of what Commissioner Wayans mentioned about Black History Month and the heritage we have in this county. And he mentioned the cemeteries and the schools. If you're, if anyone's interested, our Board of Tourism has a brochure put together that lists all those sites that Commissioner Wayans had mentioned. So if you're interested, I think you can get the brochure in the lobby or you can probably go online and you can do your own self tour of all of our African-American history in our county. With that, thanks Steve for mentioning that. Now I appreciate the good shout out. That, that, that's, that's important. Um, we're gonna segue into uh, our health department and health officer, uh, Ed Singer. And as uh, Commissioner Wentz shared, I attend a, a phone call every Thursday with the state and uh, it's focused on mainly the vaccinations, uh, the vaccine uh, distribution. Um, there is no lack of work that the state and the administration is doing from the governor on down. There is no lack of will and uh, level of importance they're putting on this. The challenge is the distribution, getting it out to all the jurisdictions. Uh, one, the lack of doses that Commissioner Wendt shared but then also uh, how it's being distributed across the state into our counties. I never thought, and I'm gonna segue this into uh, Mr. Singer in a second. I never thought that I would be agreeing so um, animately or clearly with Montgomery County, Frederick County, Anne Arundel County, Howard County, uh, Baltimore County. I mean, the leaders, we are very different in our uh, philosophies and our approach and our culture, but we all have been saying the exact same thing. And that is get the doses to the doses and the vaccines to the jurisdictions, to the counties, get them in the hands of the health officials for distribution because the most vulnerable populations are still out there not being vaccinated. And that's the 75 uh, plus and over. We still have 10,000 plus, and that's just a piece of what's out there uh, across the state, plus the educators and everything else. And we're gonna get into this, Ed, and I don't wanna steal your thunder, but it is all of us working together and engaging with the administration to figure out how we can um, get you as many uh, vaccines as possible uh, to get into the arms of our community. So uh, with that, let me hand it off to you um, unless anybody has anything else they want to share. Nope, go ahead, Ed, thanks. Good morning, commissioners. And I'll just say that every day has been Groundhog Day since last March, as far as I was concerned. Um, and it's, it's interesting that uh, you ended up by talking about how the big counties and the uh, small counties are kind of united on this issue. And it's often difficult. Um, I'm chairing the uh, Maryland Association of Health Officers right now group it's often difficult to come to consensus when there's differences between what the big counties need and what the small counties need, but we're a hundred percent together. I, I appreciate your support in trying to, uh, to move things forward and get us as much vaccine as we can, so we can get it to our most uh, at risk populations. Um, you guys mentioned the, any new state directives. And there was one thing that came out this week that I think bears mentioning before we, uh, 
before we get into my presentation, and that is uh, the restriction on restaurant hours was was lifted as of Monday. So uh, I want to let the community know that, that as of uh, February 1st, the restrictions uh, ordering restaurants to be closed by 10 is, is, uh, has now been lifted. Um, Commissioner, I want to thank you for sharing your, Commissioner Rothstein, I want to thank you for sharing your story because uh, I know that uh, this, this whole thing of quarantining and isolating uh, people has been very difficult. People go stir crazy when they're stuck in the house for two or three days and they buy all the the bread and milk and toilet paper that are in the store because they've got to be stuck home for, for two or three days. But, you know, we've been asking people to stay home for, for, for as much as 14 days. And, and uh, I know how much of an inconvenience that can be to people. And Mr. I appreciate you setting uh, the appropriate example and in, in following the CDC guidelines and, and, and uh, everybody in the community that's been cooperative because we know how big an inconvenience this can be, but it does, make a huge difference in, in limiting the, the spread amongst our community members. So that said, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my presentation and we'll just- hey, let, I apologize. Let me just interrupt you real quick is um, the contact tracing. Um, once my son and uh, uh, Sam and Audrey tested positive um, and it got put into the system, they did get notified uh, by Maryland for the contact tracing and they were given uh, instructions uh, on what to do. They were also asked who else were they in contact with, where, you know, and, and walk them through uh, the entire process. So it works. And uh, I'm very proud, again, of uh, those that are, um, you know, out there doing this um, and keeping us safe. But uh, I, I just wanted to let you know, because you and I talked about this was, you know, let's be honest about everything and let's get up front because the only way we're going to get through this is by, by doing just that. So just a shout out to those guys and your entire team. Go ahead. Yeah. And, and, and thanks for mentioning that commissioner, because one of the important things I want people here in Carroll County to know is uh, we, we decided to take uh, the lead on this in, 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 in our jurisdiction. So a lot of the counties are deferring to the state and allowing things to go to a call center out in Chicago through uh what's what's known as NORC and and we've not had the best experience when we when we've been uh struggling to to be able to keep up when we've had this uh big spike um when, when things get booted at the NORC they just don't go well and I'm glad we're able to to work with people here locally and and, and be that local connection for people so our contact tracers are just doing an outstanding job and it's it's uh it's not always a pleasant job because it is hard for for people to uh to stay home it, it impacts their ability to make a living and 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 often go to work and go to school and, and things like that that we want to be doing so a, a big thanks to all the community and to the contact tracers um just sharing our our, our normal data that we normally share the uh COVID cases by week and as you can see it seems like we're in a little bit of a downward trend which is which is great but uh it's it's also to keep it in perspective we're still at a level where we're uh just as high as we were around Thanksgiving time frame, and you can look where we were back in, uh, you know, back in the summertime and in September and October. And uh, obviously, we're still not in a good place, but at least the trend seems to be in a in a, in a positive direction. And here's our 14-day rolling average. And again, you can notice here that we're uh, we're right around the same place we were around Thanksgiving time frame, which is which is not good. Where we're, we're uh, we're trending downward, but we're still at, at, at a pretty high uh, level of number of cases that are circulating in our community. This is our COVID uh, cases and uh, age by uh, by age group each week. I, you know, I can't really say, but for some reason, the uh, 30 to 44 seems to be uh, where we saw the where we actually saw an increase, while everything else is trending down this week. And don't have any any reason why for that. It may just be a, a a blip on the radar screen. Hospitalizations, um, you know, hospitalizations. The, the the hospital still seem seems to have uh, you know our highest level of patients that uh, we've had since the beginning of the pandemic. Obviously, we've gotten over this big hump that we had, uh, along with all the cases that we 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 had as as far as hospitalizations are concerned. But the hospital's still seeing uh, in the twenties of of COVID patients that they're treating each day. And, and I want to say one of the things that we're trying to work on 
and I, and this is a word I want to get out to the community and commissioners, anything we could do to spread this word. We, we just started thinking about there's a, a treatment out called monoclonal antibody treatment that we want people to, to talk to their physicians about if they test positive for COVID. And, and the reason, you know, normally this would be something uh, that, that, that people would normally be talking to their own physician about and, and should be talking to their own physician about, but, you know, we, we've made access to testing pretty easy here um, at our test site and also at a lot of the pharmacies, you can go in and you can get a test without a physician's order. Well, the problem is people are testing positive for, for COVID and, and I really want to encourage people, especially those people who have underlying health conditions and, and people who are over 65 to talk to your doctor because um, we really want to, we as a health department are going to work on trying to make sure that when somebody tests positive, they know they should be talking to their doctor and they should be talking to them about whether they, whether uh, the monoclonal antibody treatment is the right thing for them. What this does is essentially helps people have, it lessens the symptoms. You've got to get to it. You'd have to get the treatment. It's an infusion infusion treatment within the first 10 days of, of, of having, uh, of having COVID, but it helps keep people out of the hospital. And, you know, while we've we've had people monitoring their people have been mo monitoring their own pulse ox and things like that to determine whether they they would meet admissions criteria to the hospital and potentially need to be hospitalized. I think this is an opportunity for people to do something that's a little more proactive in, in, in being treated. If you've actually contracted COVID, talk to your physician, talk to them about a monoclonal monoclonal antibody treatment. And whether it's appropriate for you or not, especially people who are over 65, they all seem to fall into that category. Seems to be very effective and, and will help relieve some of the strain on our hospitals. So that's why I kind of throw it here in here at this point in the presentation is our hospitalizations are still, you know, while it's while it's relatively stable and the hospital's breathing a little easier these days, we still want to keep people out of the hospital. Um, our hospitalizations and deaths. And obviously we're getting much better at treating people, I think, because uh, if you remember back early in the pandemic, when you were looking at the 65 plus, we had about an equal number of hospitalizations and equal number of deaths. Well, the hospitalization bar keeps going up. The, the death bar is not climbing nearly as, as quickly as the, uh, as the hospitalization. So, you know, I'm glad that modern medicine is able to catch up with some of this, provide better treatments, and we're, 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 we're better able to take care of people. Um, next slide. Obviously, I've said said a lot that we're we're, we're not out of the woods. Um, last week was our worst week for a number of community deaths that we've had since the pandemic started. We had five people living independently in the community, and this, you know, th this is, excludes uh, long-term care facilities um, and, and that type of data. That five people in our community died last week. That's that's terrible, and. Uh, you know, it's it's not much we can do about it other than get people vaccinated and try to get through this pandemic and, and continue to do what we're doing with, with masks and social distancing. I, I know, you know, this has gone on for a long time, but we're going to get through this, and, and there is a, a light at the end of the tunnel. Of course, here's the pyramid I've been sharing with you on a, on a regular basis. Obviously, we as a health department are still in 1B. So uh, in the week of January uh, 31st, we're continuing in phase 1B uh, as, as doses allow. We've, we've really focused this week. We've, we've been giving a percentage of our doses to the, uh, the, 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 edu the education sector, but really been trying to concentrate on the uh, 75 plus. And as we get further into 1B, we're going to need to get into higher education and, and the uh, critical continuity of government type of folks. So here, here's our data on the amount of vaccine we've been uh, we've been receiving, and I think, uh, Commissioner, that you guys were hurt a little bit as he, as as uh, we really got cut the week of uh, January 31st as the amount of vaccine we were receiving. But I think it would have been worse had it not been for local elected officials reaching out to the governor's office and and trying to do something about that. And uh, the week of Feb for our doses for the week of February 7th are actually a little bit better, um, 1,200 doses. So we'll see what our allocation is for next week, uh, the, going into the next week. But um, I guess the only thing I'd point out here data-wise is we're trying to get the doses out as quickly as we can. And the week of January 24th, the, the states promised us a floor 
a, a minimum of 700 doses per week. So we're actually trying to start to dip into our, our week, or week into our allocations a week in advance, so that we're a little bit ahead of uh, a little bit ahead of schedule. So there were 1,671 doses given in the week of uh, January 24th, and that's because we had an extra clinic uh, on a Saturday and vaccinated some people with the uh, with the doses that were in the 800 that we were getting for the week of um, of, of the 31st of January. Uh, next week's going to be our busiest week. Um, we we have uh, a total of, uh, I, I think, um, just trying to think the number exactly. We've got 1,300 first, first doses scheduled for 75 plus and for the education sector. And we have uh, a total of 1,500 second doses. So we'll be administering uh, 2,800 doses next week is, is what the plan is. Um, this state is kind of important and, and you know, commissioners had asked, I, I know you all had asked kind of how we're progressing on things and that it's, it's, it's really hard for me to, uh, to tell you uh, how many of the people in 1A got vaccinated because so many different uh, groups of people vaccinated them, whether, you know, if somebody works in the city at a, at a hospital or something, they probably got vaccinated there. I can tell you how many we vaccinated and I can tell you Right now, the demand of, of uh, us getting calls from people who are in 1A that still haven't been vaccinated is very low. Unfortunately, I can't tell you what the percentage is that was vaccinated versus the percentage that decided that they didn't want to be vaccinated. But um, you know, estimates are that probably 70 to 80 percent of the people in 1A ha have actually been vaccinated and, and the rest ha have uh either declined or, or, or chosen not to, or, or not, not able to get vaccinated for another reason. But I think we're, we're uh, there, there are going to be some stragglers that are still in 1A that need to be vaccinated, but I think we've reached, uh, at least everybody's been offered the opportunity to be vaccinated that's in this group. Um, the assisted livings and, and congregate settings, the pharmacies are starting to make progress with those. Um, the 75 plus population. So I think there's, you know, while we haven't reached all these people yet and we want to get to them as quickly as we can, we're beginning to make some progress. Um, so there, there's an estimated uh, 2,610 people in that age group that have been vaccinated. Uh, 996 of those were vaccinated by the Carroll County Health Department last week. <laughs> the remainder of that number is uh, people who are in the long-term care facilities that were vaccinated through the pharmacy program. So we're, we're at a point where we've vaccinated roughly 25% of that 75 plus population, which, you know, that's, that's making a little bit of progress. We, we, uh, you know, we aren't as obviously as far as we'd like to be, we'd like to have them all vaccinated by now, but, but we're at least moving along. And out of the 800 doses that we, we received for this week, there are 500, um, 75 plus that are scheduled at the uh, South Carroll senior center this week. And um, I had a lot of discussion with your public works folks and emergency management folks about, you know, us moving these clinics around the county. And while it's not easy and, and it, it's really a heavy lift right now because as Commissioner Rothstein pointed out, the public works folks are dealing with snow and snow removal and all that. They're also supporting us in our clinics and, and uh, citizen services and rec and parks are providing us some people and we've got all kinds of volunteers and, so, so it's, it's, uh, we, we think that it's important to be able to reach each part of the county. Um, next week, we're going to be going to Tawny Town, and, and folks are beginning to register um, people out that way today for the clinic that will be out there next week. And then we're going to move on to uh, Mount Airy the week after that. And the goal is to, to hit the uh, Hampstead, Manchester area the following week. So... We, we're also going to give our, our second doses at those same locations when, when that time comes. Um, and then we're given some thought as to whether or not we would do a second round when we get to the 65 plus population uh, to hit all those senior centers again. And, and again, it's a lot of effort on everybody's part. And, and you know, it, it's, uh, it's a lot of hard work to, to, to go to multiple locations. It's easy to, uh, a lot of counties are just having, them, have, having their clinics in, in one location and trying to get the uh, people to come to them. We're having some discussion about whether getting around once is gonna be enough and then we would try to use uh, transportation assets to get people to uh, a centralized location and maybe we'd run 
uh, clinics in one or two places. But uh, but right now we are going to hit each each senior center location in the county, and we're going to reach out to people who are in those zip codes and try to try to get to them and make it as convenient for them as possible. The other thing is is that the um, unfortunately the state keeps trying to drive things from the state level, and I think we have pretty good plans here. But it's been put upon your citizen services department to uh, to try to figure out plans for um, for, for large congregate living uh, elderly communities. And um, I actually think we're reaching this population anyway, but uh, Celine and I are talking about how we're gonna um, try to figure out how many people are in these locations that need to be vaccinated. And the state's asking them to focus, focus on one of these a week. And we're talking about whether we might work with LifeBridge uh, in conjunction with them or in conjunction with pharmacies to try to, uh, if there's, you know, 150 people or something that need to be reached in a certain location, uh, sending a mobile team out to them. Uh, there, there's a lot of ideas we have about how that might be done, but uh, there was a, um, a memo that came out from the, uh, from the Secretary of uh, Health and the Secretary of Aging uh, directing the, the counties to, to, to do certain things, and we're trying to figure, figure out how that fits in with our plans. I, I kind of almost think that it's better for, for them to let us do our own planning at the local level but we're gonna comply with the directive and, and figure out how to best do that. Um, on the education sector, we vaccinated 224 people in conjunction with the school system um, yesterday. So we're up to a total of uh, 2,328 people that have been vaccinated in the education sector. And um, I think that's, that's actually um, about 35%, it's 32% of this part, portion of 1B and it's 35% of the uh, education sector. So we're making progress there as well. Um, we were directed to add higher education this week to the, uh, to the 1B group. So we're gonna be figuring out where they fit in. I um, sent uh, emails to both presidents of the community college and the, uh, and the McDaniel and asked them to come up with a list and an estimate. I, I, I threw a ballpark figure in there of 500 people. I really don't know how many it is, but we're, uh, we're, we're gonna be needing to vaccinate them as well. Um, one other thing to say about the education sector, and it's that this is just not teachers. It includes uh, instructional assistants. Um, it includes the bus drivers, um, other support workers that are involved in the school and the education system. So <laughs> it's, it's um, it's actually a little more difficult for us to track sometimes because, uh, you know, it's easy. I can, I can pick out all the teachers we've vaccinated, but we're, we're also trying to figure out, you know, making sure that we've hit those transportation workers, especially because they've got to drive the, the kids on the bus every day and, um, and all the support staff, the, the, the educational assistants, classroom assistants, and, and even the uh, food service workers that are working in the schools are, are part of this group. So, um, we're getting there and uh, we're making progress. And you, you know, the, the total of 7,086 people that I've got over there, that, that's the total number. You know, if we figure that only 80% of those are gonna be vaccinated, maybe the real number's closer to, uh, to, to 5,500 or 6,000. I, I don't know exactly what that's gonna be. But we'll essentially the way, unfortunately, the way we're figuring out when we're through these groups is when when there's no longer a demand, that's when we, we know that it's time to move on to the next group. Um, in phase 1C, there's an estimated uh, 1,322 people that have been vaccinated, and 408 of those have been vaccinated by the health department. And that's not because we're focused on people who are 65 to 74, it's because they fall into one of these other categories. Some of them are probably school teachers or daycare providers, or, or work in uh, work as first responders, and, and they're they're in that age group, but they're also in one of these other groups in in one B. So some of these groups overlap. While we're not focusing on that 65 to 74 age group yet, and we'll get there once we get through everybody in one B. Um, we we have vaccinated uh, 1,322 of those folks, and there's also 36 people vaccinated in this one uh, C group, according to our our data from. Uh, from from our vaccination data, you know, that probably fit in one of these other groups up, up here. They're, they're probably 75 plus and, and working in one of these sectors. So we're trying to uh, provide you as uh, up-to-date and accurate data as we can as far as the progress we're making so that you kind of have an idea where we stand. 
spent a lot of time on that slide, but I think it was really important. Again, uh, most up-to-date information related to our vaccine efforts and any information about uh, vaccinations, go to our website. Uh, please, if you know somebody who's 75, I was talking to, we've got a, um, we've got peer support facilitators who work with a lot of the disadvantaged uh, population and whatnot. And one of our peers was talking to me this morning and people are assuming just because you have an underlying health condition or something else, you're automatically going to be signed up for a vaccine. If you haven't called the health department or, or, or gotten on our list through our website, please do so, get signed up. We want to be able to reach everybody. There's still people out in the community that think that somebody's going to automatically reach out to them. We don't know where everybody is or who everybody is. We've done our best to, to reach out through lists that we have to reach everybody. But if you, if you don't know that you're on a list, you know, you can call our call center. We can verify whether you're on the list or not. And if you're not, we can add, get you added to the list. But we want to make sure that everybody who's 75 and older has an opportunity to get vaccinated before we move on to the next category. So please, please reach out to us. We'll do the best that we can. And I know it's frustrating that people are having to wait weeks, but it's better to uh, wait weeks and get vaccinated than, than to get left behind and we get into phase 1C and then it gets more difficult for us to, to get you in and, and, and get you vaccinated. So I'll stop there and uh, answer any uh, questions that the commissioners might have this morning. Really well said, Ed, and I uh, appreciate all the information and the continuing uh, persistence that you and your team have. The one thing uh, you didn't share, but it's important for the community to, to recognize is that you're not settled and neither are any of us with the numbers that you know, we have right now, the amount of doses uh, that you're receiving. You're requesting a whole lot more than what you're receiving. Um, and, you know, it's not that you're settling, you're dealing with what the numbers you have. But, uh, but it's important that we're not, you know, just asking for 700 or just asking for 12, 1300, and while everybody else is asking for a whole lot more. The other piece is, and you shared this with me and I think others, you have the ability to vaccinate a whole lot more with the team that you have, correct? And if you can uh, talk just a minute or two on those two things. So I think I, I talked to my team yesterday actually again and just said, hey, if we actually get the amount of vaccine, I'm asking for 5,000 doses a week. And my, my thought is, and, and just, uh, I, I think that would be about our capacity because if I had to give 5,000 first doses, we'd have to give 5,000 second doses at some point too. So we'd be talking about the health department uh, in conjunction with, you know, we, we've got a lot of partners in this. It's, it's the school nurses, it's the uh, volunteers and volunteer Maryland that we're pulling from. Uh, a lot of people from the community have stepped up and your staff have stepped up to help us, help us with this. But we think we could easily run two vaccination sites and possibly even a third we do get to limiting factors in, I got to have a certain number of qualified people to uh, manage the safety and the chain of the vaccine and everything else at each clinic. So two is probably a, an, an ideal number for us, but we think we can put, we, we know we can put a thousand people a day through one of our clinics at one of the senior centers. And, you know, if we, if we get to the point where we're getting 5,000 doses a week, we'll probably open up two kind of centralized sites as our, as our regular basis of operation and uh, and operate from there and we'll, we'll get a thousand people a day through there and and we'll continue to do that as long as we can get vaccine. Now, as we get into 1B and 1C, as I've said, the, the pharmacies will become a very important part of that because they, they do a great job during flu season, vaccinating anybody who wants a flu vaccine. And if we have enough vaccine that anybody who wants it can get it, hey, that that's where that's where it should come. But right now, you know, we've got the ability to do this. We've got the ability to reach the right people and it, it needs to be prioritized. And it's really hard uh, for people who don't have computer access and don't have um, email addresses and whatnot to sign up on a, on the Giants website or, and, and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to discount that they're not going to be an important part of this, but it's, in, they, don't, they don't have people to assist people and help them navigate the system. If, if, uh, if, if they want to get vaccinated at Giant or at a commercial pharmacy or something like that, and they don't have the ability to reach out to, to people who don't have technology 
and get them signed up. So we have the capacity to do it. We're asking for more doses and uh, we appreciate the help of all of the community partners. The, the health department can't do this on our own and there's a lot of people who are helping and I, I certainly would not want to miss uh, thanking everybody who, who's assisting us out there. So um, it's, it's, it's quite a collaborative effort and really appreciate the support we're getting out of everybody. It's a community effort. It's a local effort. And, and that's, that's, you know, that's the way this is. Uh, health departments are required by CDC to have plans to mass vaccinate and mass dispense. And it's not anything that's ever planned on the state level. It's a, it's a local effort and it has to be, or else you're not going to reach the right populations at the right time. You're looking at a minimum of five months to even get through the counting. Is that roughly accurate? Well, Commissioner, it, I I don't know how accurate that is. It depends on how how quickly some of these other vaccines become available. Because if we can get through, you know, this phase one B and one C, and we can start vaccinating the general population, and more vaccine becomes available, I don't know what the answer to that is. It depends on 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 the supply that's available. If, if supply becomes readily available and it becomes available in just about any pharmacy, we could get through this a lot quicker. But right now. The limitation is on the amount of supply that's coming out. And, and I really can't, you, you know, there are other, um, there are other uh, vaccine um, distributors who are on the horizon of getting approval. I don't know how soon that'll happen, and I don't know how much they'll be able to produce. All I can say is what we have right now, and, you know, it, it, it is going to be several months at least. I was hoping by summertime we might have a good, you know, 60%, 70% of the population vaccinated, but... Uh, we're going to have to wait and see. I, I don't think there are any guarantees there. Thank you. Okay, anything else? Uh, just one question, Ed. I had uh, a couple folks reach out to me, and I listen, I appreciate your help yesterday because you're talking about the 75 and over. Uh, some of those folks are do have challenges uh, a lot of them don't even have a computer. So, uh, so I appreciate your help on a couple of them yesterday. Uh, a couple reached out to me also uh, because I know the state is opening up a couple mass vaccination centers, I, I believe beginning tomorrow. Uh, they can, they're, they're welcome even if they live here to, to try to register at those locations as well, correct? Yep, uh, that, that's, that's my understanding. Um, however, I, I hate to say this, I've been asking, I don't even know how you register for those sites at this point. So um, we, we're trying to put those resources on our webpage so that if people really wanna try to chase after a vaccine someplace different while, while they're waiting for us to get to them on the list, we're, we're trying to make those resources available. But I'm, I, I do understand that they're gonna be opening these sites and that you will need an appointment, but I'm not sure how you get an appointment at this point. And we'll continue to look into that and we'll try to, uh, provide a link on our website once we once we figure it out. Mr. Stinger, I really appreciate that chart you show listing the quantity of people in each one of the categories and how many have been vaccinated. That's helpful for us and the public and understand where we're at and what we're up against. So as always, you do a fantastic job and we appreciate what you're doing. Okay, again, um, I'll be on the call this afternoon at uh, 1230 uh, with, I expect, um, <clears throat> Secretary Schrader, the Deputy Secretary, and the, all the other jurisdictions uh, getting the update on what's happening uh, around the state. Um, as Commissioner Wance shared, if you get the opportunity to listen to a uh, state of the state, um, our governor did talk uh, most of the talk dealing with the pandemic and the concerns that uh, we have across the state. Um, so Ed, any parting thoughts and uh, we'll let you go. You're muted. Sorry, I lost my, uh, I lost my, you know, when you're dealing with multiple screens, I, I took the presentation down and I lost where, where you were. Now, I really don't have any other thoughts. I just, uh, again, I want to thank the community for all they're doing to try to limit the spread as we get uh, vaccine out there and try to get through this and, and hopefully see the light at the end of the tunnel. So uh, I, I'm looking forward to hopefully uh, 
maybe we can go watch a football game the, next year or, or, or something like that. And, and, you know, high school sports and things like that, that everybody seems to take a lot of enjoyment in. And, and, and a lot of the things that we've missed out for the past year, we want to get back to those, but uh, you know, we're not there yet, but at some point in time, hopefully we'll get there. Oh, Mr. Singer, I'm surprised your fellow veterans didn't mention your army tie. It looks very nice. So I got this from uh, one of your one of your people who's been a stalwart on your uh, Larry Burbank uh, got this for me and uh, Larry's a, a local veteran who was a, a helicopter pilot and uh, I think the Vietnam or Korea I, I don't remember but anyway yeah. great guy and, and very involved with your veterans council and, and uh, you know I'll give a shout out to Larry because he's just a wonderful person and he's the one who hooked me up with the tie so thanks commissioners you all have a good day. You have a great day, and you're right. Larry uh, Burbank is a rock star in our community. Okay, let's follow up. Uh, Mr. Fowler, Mike, you on? I am on. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. The floor is yours. All right. Well, we're uh, we're about three weeks into the session at this point. Uh, the the floor sessions still remain sporadic. Uh, for example, there's there's nothing today. There are sessions in both chambers tomorrow. The House has announced their calendar for the remainder of the month, and they've got five dates slated for floor sessions. And uh, several of those will be extended sessions. So they're really going to start getting into the business of, uh, of consideration and debate on these bills. Uh, yesterday, the, the governor's budget uh, was presented by Secretary Brinkley to the MAKO Legislative Committee, uh, laid out uh, the governor's thinking and, uh, and, and how he's, uh, he's set up the budget. He did get a couple of questions from the floor about the impacts to local governments, and, and, and as expected, his answer uh, is that that needs to be taken up with the legislature. I mean, that's the, uh, that's the point of the BRFA bill. So we're, uh, we, I say we as a, as a body um, of counties will be working through MAKO to address some of those impacts that have been identified. Um, of course, his, his, his other bill associated with COVID relief is, uh, is in play. It has passed the Senate with some amendments, uh, goes over to the House, and that's, I think, where the real back and forth will uh, will take place. So that House version is being heard in ways and means today. So Mago's concerns will be uh, brought forward by Mago staff today. Uh, also, the Legislative Committee took uh, positions on five, again, subtraction modification bills. We've discussed these where uh, by, by making a subtraction modification, there's an impact to local revenues as well. And MAKO typically opposes those bills, not the substance of the bill, but simply that it's a state action. Uh, it should be done as a state tax credit, which would leave your, your revenues intact. That's, a, that's a, the state taking an action that impacts you directly. Uh, the glyphosate ban uh, was heard yesterday in the House committee, and uh, the sponsor agreed to amend uh, agriculture out of the bill so it would pertain only to state and local governments. Uh, there was strong opposition. The Farm Bureau, uh, DNR, surprisingly, uh, they, they used this for their integrated vegetation management programs. A number of local governments do that as well. Um, also, there's a, a bill in uh, that you find interesting. There's a, a goal. Uh, the bill sets a goal to preserve over a million acres of productive agricultural land by 2030. And it does that through a combination of MAUF, Rural Legacy, uh, Maryland Environmental Trust, and, and local programs. So that hearing is scheduled for uh, the 17th next week. So I'll keep you apprised of how that, that bill moves through uh, the process. Spent a lot of time last week talking about the Climate Solutions Act uh, that was heard last week. There really wasn't any opposition. The realtors came in as opposed, but kind of modified their position. They're really only concerned about 
the energy efficiency standards apply to commercial buildings that the commercial real estate market is pretty challenged right now. It will continue to be, I suspect, uh, as a lot of employers determine that some of their staff can be working remotely, that some of this uh, real estate stock may be vacant for, for the foreseeable future. So that was the only concern brought forward, which I thought was interesting. And we talked about some of the politics of this, that since this is a bill that the Senator uh, really wants, that when it moves to the House, perhaps that's where some horse trading begins. So I don't suspect the bill will, will go forward in its current form. I think there's, there's going to be some, obviously, some changes to that. Uh, on the education front, uh, House Bill 894 is enabling legislation. I think uh, Commissioner Wance may have mentioned this in an earlier session, um, that it would, would enable a, a certain units within uh, a community college to organize. Um, the House version is scheduled for hearing on the 11th, and uh, obviously, or excuse me, not on the 11th, um, not, doesn't have a hearing scheduled yet. Uh, the only thing I can tell you about that is similar bills have been put forward in the past. They've not moved, uh, but there's a lot of uh, momentum behind this from labor this year. So we'll be taking a close look at that one. On the election front, uh, we've got Senate Bill 29 put forward being heard today. Uh, this is a this really changes the game. It would require mail-in ballots sent to every registered voter you would be required to have the same number of polling places as you did in the 2020 election, but they would be spaced geographically because we are going to have a mail-in and an in-person uh, voting regime. So any voter from any district would be able to walk into any polling place and cast a vote. So how so we have to we have to sort of figure out how all of that works with the mail-in versus the walk-in and and how you don't have double voting uh so that's going to be one that i think gets a lot of scrutiny uh, on the public health side uh senate bill 67 would authorize ems personnel to deliver COVID vaccinations under certain uh, certain criteria, such as being supervised by, by doctors and so forth. Uh, I did pass the Senate unanimously. It's an emergency bill. So when it passes the House, it gets enacted uh, immediately. It does sunset in 2024. So obviously intended to be a temporary measure to get us through this, this COVID battle. Uh, Senate Bill 645 is a, a proposal by the champion of the 911 uh, changes that we saw last year, Senator Kagan. Um, she seems to be now concerned that the current procurement practices for purchases that go before the uh, the 911 Emergency Services Board that are over 500,000 need to be scrutinized more heavily for uh, for their MBA participation uh, requirements. And all of the 911 uh, directors are very opposed to this. Uh, it's, it's a tough situation because Senator Kagan has really been a, a friend to the counties on the 911 issue and, and other issues too. So it, it appears that she's gotten the message that this is problematic. Uh, specifically, it's, a, it's about the way the, the procurement is done where one county takes the lead and the other counties piggyback on that contract. But they're still, at the, at the local level, they're still going through the requirements for MBE and such. So they think it it's, adds an additional layer of bureaucratic review and delay. So we're going to be keeping an eye on that, but MAKO is also going to carry that, that issue forward on our behalf. So that brings us to, uh, to a subject that I want to go in, in much more detail uh, today, and that's this issue of police reform and accountability. So we knew that this was going to be a, a very significant issue that was going to move forward in some way this session. 
Um, so it's going to pass in some form. And there are a couple of bills, well, several bills in play that address the issues of the law enforcement officer's bill of rights, uh, body cameras, use of force, and uh, public information act requests. So there are two major bills that address this, one in each chamber, and they both repeal the law enforcement officer bill of rights. And as you know, that's the set of protocols, protections, if you will, process that outlines how a police officer uh, will be treated uh, for a, a complaint of, uh, of misconduct. So the major goal is, is making the misconduct charges and any subsequent dis disciplinary process or just the review in general to make that more transparent to the public. So the first bill in the Senate is Senate Bill 627. Uh, Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights Repeal and Procedures for Discipline. So this is a repeal and a replacement sponsored by Senator Carter in Baltimore City. Uh, it, it deals really exclusively with misconduct and review and discipline. Um, it also determines what information can be released publicly, outlines the process that's going to be followed for a complaint. Uh, it does leave enforcement of the process mostly up to the police chiefs. It also allows the county who wants to create an oversight body to take that process under their control to do that. So it's, it's enabling in that way. The other larger bill that comes from, it's introduced by the speaker, it comes from the work that came out of the work group over the summer, uh, the work group to address police reform and accountability. So this is much more highly specific on structure and process, talks about limits on the use of force, but some limits on serving warrants, uh, deals with increased training of police officers, mental health evaluations, implicit bias training. Uh, it's the, it mandates body cameras, which the other bill does not. It gives you till January 1st, 2025. So it's not specific on the subjects that, that float around that about storage, um, about record keeping and that sort of thing. It simply says, basically you have a couple of years to figure this all out. It has a, uh, a condition in there to pay full tuition for four-year degrees in criminal law, criminology, or criminal justice, uh, as long as the individual serves at least five years as a police officer in the state during the eight-year period following their graduation. It creates an independent state agency to investigate use of force incidents that's, that's comprised of sworn officers and citizens, and that would apply for incidents of death or serious injury. And that group would then report to the state's attorney to determine whether the officer should be charged. It establishes a trial board that has to be comprised of at least one third of citizens, and the officer has the right to the trial board uh, prior to discipline. Now in this bill, there's a county role in the process. The county needs to uh, convene an independent agency to investigate citizen complaints. It establishes what's called an administrative charging committee comprised of the county attorney who becomes the chair, the director of internal affairs for the respective police force, a representative from the public defender's office, the designee of the state's attorney's office and one civilian. So following investi so the complaint comes in following an investigation by the sheriff department, those files are then forwarded to the charging committee. They determine whether to charge the officer based on, on certain criteria. And if it is chargeable, they recommend discipline based on the policy that's in effect. And that goes back to the chief or in, in our case here, the sheriff. And they actually have the ability to uh, request subpoenas if they need more information. So this 
this creates a couple of significant issues for a county like Carroll County and frankly for any county that is uh, that has a, a an elected sheriff. I think the bill was was put together with the mindset that police forces in the state have a police chief who is appointed by the executive, either the county executive or in a municipality, the, the mayor, and then confirmed by the council. In a county where you have commission and you have a sworn, uh, excuse me, you have a, an elected sheriff, you're now setting up a conflict here where you would have oversight over another duly elected official. It also requires in this, this uh, administrative charging committee that two of those members must be from the jurisdiction, jurisdiction where the offense occurred. So it specifically mentions about the county has to create this charging committee but is it's silent on whether a municipality has to create this committee. So what that means is you become the charging committee for the municipalities in your county. And because the way that committee is comprised, the citizen needs to be from the jurisdiction where the incident occurred. And the member from internal affairs needs to be from the jurisdiction or the force where this occurred. So you'd have to sort of reconstitute this committee depending on where that complaint came in from. So question is what to do about this. Um, Mako is in, in a tough position because the, 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 as you can see the, the sort of conflicts and tensions in the bill. So in terms of taking a position, very difficult to take a position. Number one, you can't oppose the bill. Uh, the, the bill is gonna move forward. Opposing it takes you out of the conversation. So what they intend to do is provide the committees with a, a letter of information that lays out some of these challenges that we see. Um, that will keep MAKO at the table. The, the executive director has already gotten a commitment from leadership that MAKO will remain in this discussion. So this is sort of the, the, the beginning of this. Um, Commissioner Wance was part of that discussion yesterday. Uh, clearly you'll have be having discussions with the sheriff as well. I think the police chiefs and the sheriffs will be, and the FOP will kind of be taking the lead on most of the substance of these bills, which, which go to process and procedures and discipline and that sort of thing um, since the chiefs are going to have the overwhelming responsibility on that but i wanted to point up these these challenges that are specific to you um and and that that's kind of where i'm going to end today because i think you, you may have some questions or want to have some discussion about this hey mike i appreciate it. i do have one question i've seen on social media um, discussion about SROs and, uh, you know, is there legislation to get rid of SROs in the schools at this point or where, where is this bubbling up from? Yeah, the, there's a proposal that the SROs, um, it, and I think there are a couple of bills that address with this. One says they, they really can't be police officers in the sense that they carry weapons and they have the ability to arrest. Um, there's also, I think, pro uh, sort of proposals that that say we really should change that into more mental health and counselor type of people as opposed to police officers. Um, and you're going to see a, a, a range of opinion on that. I think in the more urban jurisdictions, they have concerns about that, and I think they're they're the ones that are. Uh, more interested in reducing the the policing and the optics of police in schools, uh, where other jurisdictions are quite comfortable with with how it's been to date. Uh, it, it's interesting that I think two or three years ago in the session is when this all came about as a result of several school shootings, and 
everyone was all in on the SRO concept. And now a couple years later, after some of these uh, social justice and equity issues have come up, that there's some rethinking on that. So I can get you more details on the specific bills and exactly how they lay that out, but that's sort of the concept that's being looked at. Okay, I, I appreciate it because, you know, uh, I'm not so concerned about opinions, uh, especially on social media, uh, because it's just a bunch of group think in my, uh, you know, in my view. Uh, <laughs> I just want to know if there's any traction that we need to be concerned about when it comes to SROs uh, in the county, or is this just a lot of talk right now to, you know, for for legislators or others just to thump their chest on their on their views and personal opinions? That's all. Yeah, I think it is something to be concerned about and taken seriously. Yes. Okay, and then the only other comment is, I still and, and Commissioner Wentz knows this. I just don't like the rule that when we disagree with something, we are not at the table anymore as far as Mako's concerned. So you can't say no, because then you lose the opportunity to voice an opinion afterwards. But that's that's my view. Commissioner Wentz, what are, what are your thoughts on this whole police reform piece? Uh, <laughs> where, where do I begin? Uh, as Mike said, we had some long discussions yesterday uh, we also had uh, some lengthy discussions Monday evening during the Rural County Coalition because uh, this specifically affects the rural counties, as Mike said, uh, more than it does the, the uh, urban counties. Uh, you know, I, th th all of these, we're going to have to really pay attention here uh, because th the potential is there to pit elected official against elected official because... Uh, you know, as Mike alluded to, uh, we could very well go up against the sheriff on some of these things, and he's elected just like we are. So, uh, you know, forming this committee, uh, I don't know how Tim Burke feels about being the chairman of a committee that's going to look at somebody who's who's got a problem, uh, one of our police officers. I, Well, I I can pretty much tell you what Tim Burke says, but he can tell you himself. Tim's on here. I'll never get another traffic ticket again. <laughs> yeah, and that and that's make that that's you know that's talking about it lightly. But you know, uh, a couple of the counties said, "Well, we've got." I think Queen Anne's. Uh, when I was talking to colleagues down there, said, "Well, we've got the Centerville Police Department." And what do we do about them? Well, okay, good for them. We've got six uh, municipality police departments that we're gonna have to take a lead in. And I'm in no way wanting as a commissioner to do any of that. Uh, it's just that that's really complex and we're getting into a place. Listen, you all know how difficult it is to fill, the, fill these boards and commissions now with people. Can you imagine filling one like that? So, there, there's a lot in these bills. Uh, kudos to Mike because he's he's really uh, Mike takes a, a good lead there in Mako, but the discussions are lengthy as to you know what it's going to how it's going to affect the rural counties, and we're we're doing all that we can. To your comment, Ed, about you know opposing, uh, we do that uh, at Mako a, a good bit when we know that the bill's not going anywhere and the staff at Mako are outstanding and they, they know exactly, uh, you know, what, what's going to happen there. If they feel like we need that seat, we'll, we'll do it, you know, support with amendments or support with a letter. Uh, so we, we, so that that seat remains there, but, uh, that's a good point into a segue of, uh, of saying, that because this session is so wacky this year, uh, it's good to have the Makos of the world to keep track of what everything is happening down there because Mako remains very powerful. Uh, and I'll, I'll end, I don't know if I answered your question, Ed, but we're all over these police reform bills. Uh, I'm gonna meet with Mike later on this afternoon uh, so that we can get on the same page too, uh, to go at this and then we'll pass on more information to you guys. Um, 
But I'll end with, you know, we're not down there face to face, which is a problem. A lot of deals get struck in the hallways down there. I've struck several myself over the last six years, um, and we don't have that. But with that said, for those that want to testify on bills, you can still do that. Uh, the, the, the challenge is it, it was three days in advance. I think they've got two days in advance now, don't they, Mike? Yeah, so we're down to two, but you have to, you have to register to speak two, two days in advance of a bill, and then you're not guaranteed that you're going to be chosen uh, to, to testify. But you can at least get your, your name in there uh, if you want to testify on these bills. So it's kind of the same, but it's really different down there uh, because you just don't have that opportunity. Um, that SRO bill is still floating around. That's in the House. Uh, and Mike said he we'll, we'll get more information on that. But what it does is it takes uh, the monies that was set aside for SROs and throws it over to mental health uh, uh, experts. So it takes it takes that money, eliminates that position, but creates positions for uh, pupil personnel workers and and uh, you know guidance counselor positions and that kind of thing. So very troubling, um, and it's still there. It hasn't been killed yet. So we're going to have to keep an eye on that. A lot going on with police reform, Ed, to your to your question. Yeah. A lot. I, I appreciate I appreciate the uh, as always the insight. Um, yeah, I think everybody knows my feelings about SROs. They're doing a great job in our community. Uh, the sheriff continues to highlight the value of the SROs. Uh, CCPS, the schools, continue to highlight the value of uh, the SROs as community. Uh, leaders within the schools, as mentors, as uh, also the force protection that they do provide. Um, so I, I'm just curious because I saw it on social media and mm -hmm. that, that's all. Um, yeah. Okay. You know, what, yeah. You know one, one, one could argue, Ed, that SROs are, are uh, helping with mental health. I mean, we've heard, we've heard cases here in, in the county where a student has, has – been challenged with something and you know the SRO has has reached out to them or spoken with them and essentially done that that job of helping that student or that 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 child through a difficult situ situation so you know I they, they might be better suited than what somebody sitting behind a desk in a tie uh, would do because plus it, it creates that sorely needed uh, connection of law enforcement to our young people these days and uh, eliminating that is just is very troubling. This is true community policing where the police officer actually has people come up to him, talk to him, uh, confide in him, uh, help through everything. I, yeah, uh, one program we've had that's really successful and they want to eliminate it. Uh, it's troubling, really troubling. Mr. Fowler, thanks as always. You articulate a very good position here in briefing us. I think Commissioner Wayans made some very good points. I think it'd be good if we had some sort of briefing or position paper from our sheriff because he has far greater knowledge on this subject than us as far as the police reform and the SROs. It'd be nice if he, if he hasn't put something together for us to advocate for him if he could. So I'd love to see what his talking points are and how we can support him on that. And I, I think Commissioner Wayans made a new buzzword, wacky. We'll add that to your list of absurds. That was a good word. Thank you. I think that goes with uh, Speed Racer or something like that. But, um, yeah, I think uh, what we got is a pretty uh, unified message from us as Board of Commissioners regarding the value of SROs that we have seen in our personal experiences. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm 100%, you know, with you uh, both or all uh, regarding our SROs and the value that they provide uh, for our students. <clears throat> and um, yeah, walking the beat, you know, the hallways does a lot of value with somebody in uniform when it comes to a, a kid, somebody to look up to. So. Uh, there's a lot of value with our SROs. Okay.
again, my personal opinion, but also uh, from the experiences that I've seen. Mike, again, I appreciate all the work that you're doing and keeping us uh, apprised along with the community apprised of uh, actions and activity going on in Annapolis every Thursday. And I know how responsive you are to all of us uh, on a daily basis. So thank you uh, for all that you're doing. Okay, let's uh, move on um, to our action items. And we got, I think, Ms. Steckel, there you are, Ms. Celine. Uh, and you're going to talk to us about FY 2021 Carroll County Bureau of Housing, the annual plan, okay. correct? And Danielle and Paul. Okay. All right. Good morning, commissioners. Um, I'm here before you this morning uh, with Danielle Yates, who is our Bureau Chief of Housing and Community Development, and also Paul Moffitt, who is our um, manager of our, our program manager for housing as well. Um, as the Board of County Commissioners, you are the governing body for our Housing and Community Development's Public Housing Authority. Every five years, we're required to develop an administrative plan that guides our Public Housing Authority, and that um, includes incorporation of all federal, state, and local regulations and policies surrounding sec Section 8 housing. Each year, we review that plan, and we, re we update it and make recommendations um, for additions or changes needed to streamline the housing choice voucher program and ultimately improving it for the delivery of the program to our citizens here in Carroll County. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Danielle to talk about our housing choice voucher program, the vouchers that we have, and then also the recommended changes that we have to our five-year plan so that we can update our annual plan for FY21. Good morning, commissioners. As Celine noted, we are here today to review the recommended changes to our administrative plan for fiscal year 2021. Our Housing Choice Voucher Program currently administers 773 tenant-based vouchers. And we just wanted to draw to your attention, there was a typo on the briefing paper. It said 778. It is 773. The breakdown of those vouchers is 524 regular tenant-based vouchers, the remainder are specialized vouchers consisting of 100 non-elderly disabled vouchers, 109 mainstream vouchers, 15 Veterans Affairs Supportive Housing vouchers, and 25 Family Unification Program vouchers. As noted, we have seven recommended adjustments to terms and policies related to our Section 8 Housing Assistance Program. Um, if you would look at the chart that we have provided, you will see that in chapter six, which is income and subsidy determination, we have three clarifications just to current policy. Within chapters nine and 11, we have two accommodations, which were for the public health um, emergencies, just pertaining to virtual inspections and recertifications by mail. In chapter 11, we are implementing a streamlined recertification for families with fixed incomes over a three year period. Fixed income sources, just so you know, include social security payments, pensions, annuities, and retirement plans. This process would affect approximately 150 of our families. 99% of those families are individuals over the age of 62, which receive only social security benefits. While we still complete a verification of income and expenses annually for two years two and three of this process, it's just a less extensive recertification process for those folks. We have been awarded an additional 124 mainstream and bash vouchers in the past two years. By implementing this streamlined process, we are able to maintain the current workload for each of our housing specialists without having to add additional staff to administer these vouchers. The final change that we have is within chapter 17, which is special housing types. We are changing our current policy of not assisting single room occupancy to assisting due to a reasonable accommodation. This is an adjustment that we need to make to ensure that we are following our federal guidelines for HUD housing quality standards, which are in 24 CFR 92, 982, excuse me, 0.401. Would you have any additional questions that we can answer for you regarding these recommended adjustments? Danielle, thanks. The, you mentioned 124 vouchers increase. Yes. It was an increase yes. to 124 or 124 additional vouchers. 
it was 124 additional vouchers that we were awarded over the past two years. It was the 109 mainstream and the 15 Veterans Affairs supportive housing vouchers. Thank you, Ms. Yates. Can, can you explain or clarify an example of how Chapter 17 revision would work so I can have a better understanding about the disability? Like, what motivated that? So it, it is a requirement. We cannot disallow it. So under a reasonable accommodation, which would be something that myself and our program manager would review, if it would meet those standards, we could allow it. But the way it works from a single room occupancy, there is an extensive um, mathematical equation that would even determine the subsidy that we would pay on behalf of that individual, since it's only a single room and it's not um, a full unit. So basically, it's a reform procedure that's being addressed by experience from you guys? Yes. It, just going back to those vouchers for a second, um, 15 veteran vouchers, is that, has that been sufficient over the couple of years, or are we looking to get more? What What's your sense on that plus the, the total number? Are we at the right place? So we would like to see more, but this is a process that we work with um, the veterans local office in Baltimore with. So they have to be in agreement to actually administer the case management that goes along with these vouchers. And they actually do the referrals to our agency. So at this point with the 15, um, that is all that the VA is willing to, I guess, um, to to, to provide case management services for. So I think they have restrictions in just the amount of um, caseload management they can handle. Would we like to see more? I'm sure Celine can um, agree. We absolutely would like to see um, additional VASH vouchers be administered. Um, it's like I said, again, it's just, we have to work in conjunction with our local VA office to get that referral and approval. So when you're saying local VA office, you're talking about federal, not yes. Maryland. So Correct. If there is something like this that you want to advocate for more, um, leverage us and leverage, you know, us with our relationship with MDVA, you know, and the secretary there to then say, hey, we're doing it and we're doing it well. These vouchers would not be wasted um, and we know how to use them. Uh, you know, we, we have proven processes um, in place and you know, uh, one, just highlighting them, but two, continuing to uh, further develop them, I think is important. So yes. to take a look at that. And if there's something that you'd like to leverage through the administration, through the Maryland administration to uh, USVA, you know, let's let's come up with a plan. OK, absolutely. Thank you very much. OK, absolutely. And thank you for all the work that you all are doing. So. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, I've got I've got some some questions. Uh, sure. The seven adjustments that you're attempting to make, or yes. you're 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 suggesting that we make, are these adjustments that are coming from? Uh, maybe this is in line with your question, Commissioner Rostein. Are these adjustments coming from uh, a, someone other than us, or are you making these adjustments locally? So we're making the adjustments locally. So just like the clarifications with income, as we go through our daily processes, sometimes um, things change or we feel that there needs to be more clarification. Like you'll see with the clarification for the contributions of gifts. And you'll notice that what we added in there where there are different types of um, income sources people can have now, such as PayPal, Venmo, and Cash App. So we felt that it was needed that we're very clear um, on exactly what constitutes income sources that we're looking for. Um, just like joint um, bank accounts, we wanna make sure our folks understand that if their name is on a bank account, it has to be included as income sources. So we're just trying to spell things out as clearly as we can to make sure there's no discrepancies as far as when we request information that's required. Okay, and I would, I, I would guess that these, these uh, suggestions are in line with with uh, with the Section Eight guidelines as well. We're not we're not doing something that's sort of uh, above and beyond. No, what, absolutely. Okay. Yes. Because it, it's interesting that you, you you even get down to having to 
to list things like PayPal and, and Venmo. Uh, you know, that, that we talk about um, uh, the change of times here. Uh, that's interesting. So I, I don't, okay. So if, if someone marries, so you can have, you can have two single folks that could be in the program, but if they married, it would take them out of the program. Is that what you're attempting to do here with the, with the head of household or what are you, what are you trying to do there? Again, we're just trying to clarify that if someone is an independent, so it's a mother and a child on a program. And then while she's holding that voucher, she marries her husband becomes part of that household, but so does his income. So we have to take that income to make sure they still income qualify. So we okay. want to make sure again, that it's very clear that when you know she marries, he becomes part of the household, their income is joined. Okay. And then under chapter 11, uh, Danielle, yes. you had mentioned that there's, uh, say again what the percentage was of, of just those with social security. Uh, it is, it's really like 99, I'm not kidding, it's like 99.7%. It's only 0.03% that we have where there's adults on disability. Okay. Okay. So is if is is there a i guess is there a uh, there's a difference of how much they get based on how much their retirement funds are contributing to them and social security and and is there a step down or is there a phase to, I, I don't quite understand what we're doing there so you're identifying sources of income uh and that that says whether or not they're eligible to receive these these uh, funding, this funding. The subsidy, correct. It, it, it ensures that they're able to receive the subsidy because it's income-based. And also okay. that's what drives the subsidy payment that we um, pay on their behalf as well. Okay, okay. Yeah, just when you added all those, those, yes. uh, those incomes, you know, you're like, well, wait a minute. So I would suspect that if somebody is on Social Security and is getting... I mean, because there are retirement funds now that also you could get Social Security at the same time. There's some that are doing that. Um, and that would take them out of, the, of being able to get these funds if they get correct. if they reach a threshold, correct? Correct. Okay. Okay. Commissioner, I just want to point out, I think there's a little bit of um, clarification needed here. This recommended change is not changing our eligibility for folks. It's not changing the income eligibility threshold that's already there. What this is changing is the recertification process, because typically we recertify folks on an annual basis. Okay. What we're doing is identifying a group of individuals that are older adults that only have Social Security as their income, and we're saying we know they have that standard income. It's easy to verify. And we are only going to review them on an every third year basis at the same intensity level that we that we do the recertification process for other um, individuals on the program. So it, we're not changing the income eligibility parameters for the vouchers. Okay. I, yeah, and I, I appreciate it. that's kind of where I was going. You said it much better, Celine. That's that's kind of where my line of questioning was going. So I appreciate that. Uh, you, you and so, Danielle dig very deep, and because because you guys are are on those levels, so I'm always I'm always a very basic. Okay. You, you got to explain it to me on the basic level. So we're we're. Good. Yeah. And, what, and so just what, to add just a little more to that, if um, we have somebody new to the program, we're not right away putting them into that streamlined process because we want to. Uh, have some time to see how it goes and if there's any additions made to their income for their annual recertification. So it's we're kind of analyzing as we go here to add anybody to the uh, streamlined process. Okay, thank thank you all. I appreciate that. Thanks. Sure. I like to state that. Uh, uh, Daniel, uh, Danielle, could you walk us through the remote video inspection? Why? How does that work? Absolutely. So basically, we're using either FaceTime or Zoom. Um, and what actually happens is the inspector actually has a checklist that we always go through when they're actually physically inspecting the property. And they 
pretty much take the phone or the iPad or whatever, and they go through the entire um, checklist. So Michael is our inspector, Gaffney. He's going to request that they even show simple things such as um, GFIs, which have to be in the kitchen and the bathrooms. He makes them press the smoke detectors, make sure they're working, but they go through the entire checklist to make sure. There's also an affidavit that the landlord must sign stating that there are no life-threatening conditions as well. Um, and then we also speak with the tenant singly at a different time to make sure there are no concerns that they have as well. So there's kind of in triplicate. And also what our, land, our, our, excuse me, our housing inspector is doing now is he does a drive-by of each location. So while he can't physically go in, he's still going past each property to make sure there's nothing that looks um, alarming from the outside as well. Thank you. I, I just want to state that I view this as quality control and fraud prevention. I think you guys are being very proactive. You know, in the past, I actually lost an election over this issue. I think it shows how compassionate we are that we can't just throw our elderly, disabled veterans out on the street that there's a lot of misnomers surrounding this program. And the fact that you bring this in front of us with these quality control mechanisms show that this is a legitimate operation and shows our compassion. And with that, I move that the Board of Commissioners approve the display of the annual plan for 45 days for public review and comment. Also announce a public hearing prior to April 17th, 2021. Consider approval to submit the FY21 annual plan to HUD. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. And uh, just to add on to what uh, Commissioner Boucher shared, definitely appreciate one, uh, my colleagues' uh, passion and uh, deliberate questions th throughout this discussion. And two, uh, Danielle and the entire team, uh, the ability to not just answer them, but provide uh, your candid insight, uh, allowing us to uh, keep moving forward. So this is, again, some good news. Uh, across the board. I have a motion and a second. Are there any further discussions? Seeing here none, all in favor? Moving forward, we got 4-0. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to uh, a request for approval for a 15 year extension renewal of the payment in lieu of taxes or pilot for Westminster Bond Senior Apartments. And Celine, I believe you're still up. I and am I still here. Mr. Jefferson is on. Who else are you bringing on? Um, I, have, I'm sorry. I have Ted Zaleski on as well, our um, Director of Management and Budget, and also Rob Burke, our Comptroller, uh, just because of the the, the different pieces financially that this that this um, touches on. So um, I did want to also acknowledge I have Danielle Yates with us uh, on as well, since this does include our housing uh, bureau. And what, as you're aware, we have come before you um, with Conifer Realty several different on several different occasions where we presented information uh, to request the renewal of the 15-year payment in lieu of uh, of taxes pilot agreement for Westminster. Bond Senior Apartments, otherwise known as Sunnybrook, to those of us who work uh, with folks that live there uh, and with that apartment complex. And the pilot would allow the property to be exempt from payment of Carroll County's ordinary real property taxes. Um, in June, you had already granted a one-year extension because the pilot was expiring um, by June 30th. So you had already granted a one-year extension of this pilot um, agreement and had requested additional information. So we came back before you on December 10th, provided some additional detail, which brought up a few more questions related to the physical needs and cost estimates, rental increase history, gross projected revenue, and then also rental revenue uh, versus expenses. So what we have done today in your board packets, you should have uh, received this information. I see you have it, Commissioner Boucher, thank you. Um, and so David Jefferson is here today and we've reviewed it with David uh, prior to this, and he wants to provide explanation to you and walk you through each one of the data elements and then also answer any questions that you have. So David, okay. thank you for coming on board with us today. David, prior to you uh, having a conversation or, or uh, sharing your views, are there any comments from the commissioners in moving forward and allowing David to, uh, to present at this point? 
Okay. Okay. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, again, my name is David Jefferson, and I'm the regional vice president for the Maryland area for Conifer Realty. Um, we're really excited to present today uh, in reference to preserving the pilot agreement, extending it for the next 15 years in our efforts to continue to provide affordable housing for the residents of Sunnybrook. So the first document that we'll take a look at is the physical needs uh, over term. So what you'll see in this document, we have identified capital needs that will need to happen on this property over the next 10 years, beginning with this year, 2021. And what you will see is that there are several uh, high level, uh, oh great, it's right in front of me. There are several uh, high level uh, repairs that are needed uh, to the building to sustain this housing. Um, and what you'll see at the bottom of this is what those annual costs will be for uh, making these repairs over the next 10 years. And then that is juxtaposed against our annual reserve funding for the year. So we place about $79,000 a year uh, into the reserve budget for this property. So based on that, um, as you can see, over the course of the 10 years, we are severely below um, the, the level of capital funding that is needed to do these uh, routine repairs and replacements uh, at the property. So that's what we wanted to uh, highlight in this document. Um, so in here you have, you know, the, the typical useful life uh, for the particular item, uh, as well as the effective age of what is existing at the building. Does anyone have any questions on this document? No. Um, anything else, Mr. Jefferson? Anything else? Oh, I, yes. So that that's the uh, so that's the capital needs uh, uh, assessment of the property. The next document is the historical property rents. So one of the things that this pilot allows us to do is to keep our rents below. Uh, market and also below the maximum tax credit rents that we could charge uh, at Sunnybrook. So what this chart shows is that uh, since 2011, for the past 10 years, uh, this chart is showing, um, let's see, it's the next tab. Okay, so what this tab shows is that over the course of the past 10 years, we have average keeping our rents on our one and two bedrooms uh, an average of 20 percent below uh, the, the 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 maximum tax credit rent or market rent uh, which the maximum tax credit rent is still below the market rent for Carroll County but this rent is also below the maximum tax credit rent so this pilot agreement allows us to keep our rents at an affordable rate for the seniors in this building uh, who are, you know, as you know, are living on pensions and or social security. So we want to be able to continue to uh, keep our rents on pace with uh, minimum um, increases and keep them below the max tax credit limits uh, so that we can maintain the affordability. Any questions on that document? I can go to the next one. Oh, seeing none, keep going. Thanks. Okay. So the next document is our historical gross potential rent and subsidy. So this document shows um, what our gross potential rent was for the property um, for years going back to 2004. Um, and then it also shows our uh, rental revenue uh, that was collected, our subsidy that was collected, and then it gives you a total for revenue for each year at the property. So what it's showing is that, you know, over the course of the year that we've had uh, significantly small changes in the, the gross potential rent uh, that we have charged residents. And also you can see the, uh, differences in subsidy. Now the subsidy amounts 
fluctuate based on how many people we have at the building with vouchers. So, you know, that number, that number typically will modulate depending on if we have more voucher holders or less voucher holders. Um, the reason why the income is significantly low in 04 and 05, because at that time, uh, the building was smaller in 2006, we added another wing onto the building. So that's why the income significantly is significantly higher as you go from 2006 forward. Uh, the chart in front of you is really a great illustration of this because it shows what our kind of the, the trend line of our income and also how it relates to our expenses. And as you can see, as we get to, you know, the last couple of years, those trend lines have significantly come together as they did, uh, you know, back in 2013, 14, 15, in that area as well. So we're at a place where our income is barely meeting the expenses of the property. So this is another reason why, you know, granting this pilot extension will be great for uh, this building and also maintaining affordability. Any questions on the GPR document and uh, and the expense document? Uh, how many? Um, yeah, yes, sir. How many residents are in the apartments right now in the complex? Uh, we have a hundred and fifty units there, and right now we have eight vacant units. So one hundred and forty-two occupied right now. Yes. Out of the one hundred and forty-two occupied units, how many are voucher holders? Uh, there are approximately, uh, from my understanding, about maybe 20% of those residents are voucher holders. We don't have a large number of voucher holders at this particular property. So between 25 and 30 would be fair to say are voucher holders? Yes. And Commissioner, I do also want to note that if you reference back to the chart that is the historical gross potential, they show the subsidy for our voucher holders listed on there um, and, and the amount that they're getting total from the vouchers um, through the HUD program from our Section 8 public housing voucher program. Okay. Sorry, go ahead, Commissioner Weaver. Uh, how, how are the subsidies collected? Are they given to the individual or they go directly to uh, the firm? They, they come directly to us. They don't go to the resident. Okay, so any subsidy, whatever, does not go to the resident. You you collect nothing from them. Well, the the way the subsidy, the way the subsidy works, typically there is a resident portion and then a subsidy portion. So just say for instance, after after the housing agency calculates the income of the resident, uh, say the rent on the apartment is a thousand a month, the agency determines that you know, Mrs. Jones can pay 300 a month, then 700 would come from the ages, from your housing agency. So we will receive a $300 payment from the resident every month, and then a $700 payment from the housing agency on a monthly basis. So typically that payment from the housing authority comes monthly in one check with a, uh, or one direct deposit with a, uh, uh, deposit advice that lets us know how to allocate those payments to the respective residents. Mr. Jefferson. Yes. Thanks for all these charts. This is very informative. Would you happen to know the number of what the potential rent increase would be for your occupants if you didn't get this credit? Well, you know, on our buildings, we typically do somewhere between a three to five percent increase on our buildings typically. Now, in some jurisdictions, it just depends. Like right now during COVID, some jurisdictions have limited all management companies to a 2.6 percent increase. Um, so it just depends county by county, but typically it would be somewhere between three and five percent. Because with the increase, we look at the where the max tax credit rent is, and also you know what the market can bear, and also we take into consideration you know our residents because if you know we you know go with a very uh, high rent increase, then you know we get a lot of calls, and so we try to make it somewhere that it's a reasonable increase, 
uh, and also in line with whatever the jurisdiction requires and also uh, in line with staying below the tax credit maximum. Thank you for your reply. So whether you get this credit or not, the rents should all go up, are they not? Yeah, rents will go up uh, this year. And I and on this property, we're doing a 2.6 um, rent increase because we've been doing that across the board because most jurisdictions in the state are doing 2.6. So we kind of made a decision that we want to do that across the board because we don't want to get into a situation where, you know, in one county we're doing something here and then in Prince George's County we're doing something else. Thank you, Mr. Jefferson. You do a noble work. I was wondering if we could hear possibly from our, uh, our budget director and our controller on this, if they want to weigh in, if they're out there listening, to discuss the impact of this, if we did or did not move forward with this. Go ahead, Rob. Okay, commissioners, can you hear me okay? You're good. Great. Uh, just to give a little context to the pilot itself, this is the only uh, pilot agreement that the county has in place and the only one I'm familiar with over the last 15 plus years that I've been uh, dealing with uh, this agreement. Um, I think in the briefing paper, I provided to Celine a little bit of a, a financial piece. So uh, the pilot uh, amount, while, while the agreement calls to forego what would be the calculated real property tax, the amount that uh, the pilot has called for is $62,000 as a flat dollar amount. Uh, as uh, assessments increase and the uh, tax would be increasing, that amount stays flat and the amount of savings to be uh, had will be increasing. Uh, over the last two years, that's been uh, almost 11,000 in fiscal year 20 and uh, almost 12,800 in fiscal year 21. Uh, I didn't recalculate for 22 yet. I believe the property was just reassessed uh, here in the last uh, month. Uh, and so we could look at that uh, going forward. But uh, so that's about the, the uh, dollar amounts that are in place. And uh, as we said, with the one-year extension, this would expire uh, June 30th. Um, you know, I generally calculate this credit uh, during the month of July and and rebuild them around August 1st. So that's kind of the timeline we're in. Thank you. So we're looking at uh, a loss of almost 13,000. Is that how I should look at that? That's what it was in this current year. Um, and, uh, and so it'll be in that ballpark going forward. And as assessments increase the amount uh, of, of savings or lost revenue will be increasing uh, if the amount stays the same, the 62,000. Thank you. Which, which, oh, for me, which for me begs the question, why 15 years here? Uh, because of the volatility of, of, of the, uh, the rough, you know, the rough seas that are ahead why, why are we locking in on 15 here? Wouldn't it be uh, more fiscally responsible to bring that down so as to uh, if, if adjustments would need to be made accordingly, or am I missing something there, Rob? Uh, there's, I don't believe there's any uh, legal requirement for it to be 15. Uh, the, that was basically the term of the original agreement. Um, I've often seen uh, the terms on these either tie into some tax credits or into the financing on projects. Um, so uh, I would say uh, I'd probably defer to the property owner about what their uh, plans and other uh, demands on their resources are over that period. Yeah, uh, Commissioner Lance, I, I was thinking really the same thing, uh, along with if this is the only property that we're doing this with, we're setting a precedence and, or the precedence has been set. And that does concern me um, in moving forward, especially for long-term 
uh, programs like this. So, um, Mr. Jefferson, uh, thoughts on the 15 year mark or uh, what can and cannot be done? Well, I think it does a couple of things um, for us. Uh, as you know, uh, not only are you know our expenses to run the property are going up on a annual basis, typically anywhere between uh, three to seven percent uh, going up in terms of our operating expense side. Uh, the other thing that I think is very important that you know this also this this credit you know, is uh, also helping us with, you know, maintaining this building as affordable. One of the things that, you know, with, uh, you know, tax credit buildings, you know, you can, you know, we would be forced to raise our income, raise our rents, you know, to meet our debt service, uh, because those, those costs are costs that are going to continue to go up over the next uh, 10 to 15 years. So I, I think it helps us with that. I think also one thing that you have to look at as well with Conifer is that we are investing in uh, Carroll County and Westminster. Uh, we have a new development that we have, uh, you know, been approved in our building, a 35 unit uh, affordable apartment complex in uh, Westminster City, as well as uh, the 20 unit uh uh, Westminster Way, the former Union Village, uh, which we are busy leasing up now. So we've made a significant investment in this area to provide affordable housing, not only to seniors, but now we are reaching out to a new population as we are also providing affordable housing for families in the area as well. So I think that's a significant piece that should be looked at as well, you know, as you make your decision on extending this pilot. Hey, Commissioner Wentz, I apologize for cutting you off. Did you have more? Okay. Commissioner yeah, go, go ahead. Uh, the new units, do they have, are you requesting the same tax break on those as you did on this one? I, I don't have that information in front of me, but I can find out, I can let uh, uh, Danielle or Celine know. And throughout the state, I mean, you have uh, basically units everywhere here. Do you have the same uh, agreements between other counties? We do in some instances. Um, you know, one of the things with developing affordable housing uh, because the margins just are not the same as with the development of market rate housing, you know, we do make the request for pilots uh, because it assists us in being able to deliver the units um, and also sustain the units. So we do make those requests. And we do have other you pilot agreements well. in other jurisdictions. At 15 year uh, length of time? It, it depends, you know, we have some that are 10 years, some that are 15. It, it really just depends on the, you know, the individual jurisdiction. Okay. Uh, now you said three to 7% expenses per year you add in as uh, it, it's going to cost you. Uh, when, wouldn't taxes be automatically added into that as you're calculating your expenses? Well, we well, we base those expenses, you know, on the operating expense, but the taxes, we look at that, we base that based on continuing with the pilot. So that's staying at that controllable expense level that we know it's going to be not based on the assessment. So when you factor that in, then, you know, that's another level of expense burden for the property. Which is about what, $30 a month per unit? Uh, for that to reach that twelve, thirteen thousand dollar range, yeah. If you do the math, it's somewhere around there. And do the vouchers cover additional expense if given there? Uh, would they be? Would the vouchers be to go up with the uh, rent uh, at this point or not? So the vouchers cover. So we look at vouchers the same way we would if. You know, if we had a resident who was paying the full rent, the voucher covers the same 
uh, amount of rent. So there's no difference between a voucher resident rent and a regular uh, uh, paying uh, full full pay uh, resident. There's no difference between the two in terms of the, the revenue. If you increase the rent, does the voucher increase with the rent, Daniel? Maybe. So we have to make a, oh, I'm sorry, we have to make a request for the increase. Right. So what they do is annually, they can make a request for an increase. If they make an request and it falls within our regular payment standards, we can approve it. But yes, the increase in rent would drive us to pay more of a subsidy on that person's behalf. And Commissioner, you had asked, you had asked how many um, different pilot um, agreements that, that Conifer has throughout Maryland, and they had reported that in the previous session, and they have 10 different pilot agreements throughout the state of Maryland. Like the state, Ms. Yates, you made a good clarification. That's very helpful in understanding this. Also, Mr. Jefferson, you articulated a lot of the, the things and challenges that we as a county are faced with as well. So I'm very sympathetic to what you're going through, but this affects our tax base and we're in a bit bad pinch ourselves and I foresee inflation taking place and locking this down at a set figure could be detrimental to us in the long term. Though I'm sympathetic to what you're going through, I'd like to see some sort of alternative to helping you out instead of having this in lieu of taxes with maybe helping out with increasing the subsidies. If that would be helpful to you, I'd, I'd like to see an alternative route instead of giving this 15 year extension to you. Because I think it poses a lot of problems to us on the long term and error accounting with our budget office and our controller's office. Well, I guess the, the question becomes, you know, in terms of increasing subsidy, um, you know, that a couple of things with that. One, you know, we would have to have, you know, more residents who have vouchers to their still payment standards, as Ms. Yates just mentioned, you know, we she can't just arbitrarily increase the subsidy amount for, you know, residents that are existing on the voucher program. It just kind of doesn't work that way. Um, so I think, you know, the viable option is, you know, to to do the extension. The viable option is to, to look at, or maybe we look at, you know, looking at, possibly changing the number of years on the extension. You know, maybe it's a, a 10 year extension, um, you know, um, and, you know, move from there. I mean, I think there's other ways, but I don't think that would be a viable option to increase the subsidy because there are program requirements for that. And, and then that would also, I, I guess the last piece I'll say to that is that, you know, then that would, you know, reduce Ms. Yates' ability to provide vouchers to other families in the county or in the city. Ms. Yates, would a one year, uh, if we change this to just one year instead of 15, would your office and the Steckles office be able to readjust and 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 meet the subsidies as, as are of concern to Mr. Jefferson? So it, it gets a little tricky, Mr. Jefferson is, is, is correct. So we have payment standards that they must meet. Um, when you look at a payment standard, it's the portion of their rent, including their utilities, and it can't go over that amount. So annually, they would be able to request that. I would have to see if it falls within payment standards, and if it does, we could, of course, approve that and pay an additional subsidy based on that. But remember, the subsidy is based on each individual's income how much we pay on their behalf and then how much they pay. So it's not as easy as we can just increase subsidy overall for each individual that is at Sunnybrook. And the other piece of this is to, to remember that the, the, the voucher program that we administer with our public housing authority is tied to the individual. It's not project based at a certain building. So those the subsidies that are currently being received by Conifer at Sunnybrook now do not need to remain there. If someone chooses to relocate to a different housing um, property or into a private apartment, they certainly have the opportunity to do that. And so those are not guaranteed numbers of subsidy at Sunnybrook um, or, or people that have subsidy that go to Sunnybrook, that are living at Sunnybrook, that number can ebb and flow uh, depending upon the individual voucher holder's choice. 
Thanks for the clarification. I did note we have what approximately 20% of the residents in their facility receiving subsidies. Is that correct? Yes, it's around 20 or 30%, correct. Yeah. So it's not like a majority of people in their residency are getting subsidies. The rest would be taken up by private citizens in their own lease agreements. Correct. I, I asked this question before. I can't remember. I might have gotten the answer. But are these bond departments, are they in the city limits? Westminster City? No, it is not in the city. So it's in the county. Okay. Thanks, Rob. I, I couldn't remember. All right. Well, I, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm, this is a tough one. Uh, I, I, I think this is a great, I, I think this is a good program. I, I think that uh, what we're seeing over there uh, is, is beneficial to the folks that are, that are, that are living there. Uh, my only concern as you probably already know is locking into something for 15 years. I'm having a tough time with that one. Uh, I think that's just far too long based on the volatility of what we're seeing here. Um, and I don't know how much it would be affected over those 15 years, but uh, I just, I'm uncomfortable with that time period. Um, I, I, for me, I, I guess I need a bottom line here and maybe it's Rob, you, I don't know, or Ted, um, just bottom line this on, on revenue for me. Um, what, if, if, if we would lock it in for 15, Rob, don't, I just think that's too long. I think, I mean, we balance, we balance our, but we, we work on our budget for five years um, or six, however you want to look at it. Um, and beyond that, we, we, we're not, we don't go any further than that. So, I mean, at the very least, I think mirroring how we do our, 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 our budget and revenue here would be something to look at. Um, but, you know, just not, not having a clear, and I don't know that anybody does. If I did, I probably wouldn't be sitting here having a clear knowledge of where the market's going to be in 15 years. Um, but your, your thought, your expertise, Rob, I just think 15 seems to be a little bit long here um, to lock in on something uh, that in, in the middle of such volatility here. Your, your thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah, be, Rob, just before you jump in, because I, I agree with you. Uh, Commissioner Wance, uh, keeping it to our cycle, uh, a five-year cycle, you know, makes sense. 15 years to me, it's, we're getting to a point of in perpetuity, you know, and it'll be three, four cycles of commissioners between now and then. Um, but if we keep it to our budget cycle, I think makes more sense, but go, go ahead, Rob. Sure. Just a few thoughts there. Uh, while you were having some discussion, I did peek at the uh, a recent assessment that just came out here in the last month, the assessment did not change. It had the same assessment, which means their tax assessment will, will remain the same for the next three fiscal years, fiscal year 22, 23, and 24. So uh, the tax obligation would remain the same. Therefore, the savings and the revenue loss to us would remain the same for the next three years. Uh, to my knowledge, there really are no um, restrictions on the terms of the pilot either the dollar amount, the floor, the 62,000, or the term, the 10 years, five years, 15 years. Uh, so there's variables there. Uh, as I mentioned, we're looking at about uh, almost 13,000 in savings in this past year, uh, 11,000 the year before. Um, so, you know, you could reduce the term and do a five year or something. Our risk there is pretty small since we know the next three years would be locked in. Uh, you could look at uh, adjusting that floor amount, the 62,000. It's been that for the last 15 plus years. Um, you know, that could jump by a couple thousand dollars and and set yourself up for the next 15 year cycle. The pilot is an agreement. It can also build in some kind of escalator. You could do, uh, you know, 60, 4,000 for two years and then jump to 66 or 68, you know, you can set terms like that. And I'm not even, this might be a little more creative, not even certain you couldn't set it at a percentage below tax obligation. If 
Oh, geez, I hate to do this off the top of my head, but um, you know, if you want to say 15% below market uh, of the obligation would be the pilot amount, you could probably tie it in like that. And as total taxes went up, the floor would go up, but they'd remain at 15% below the obligation. So we can sort of control the risk with the term or the uh, amount of the uh, of, of the amount they're required to pay, the payment in lieu. Mr. Burke, there's some wonderful suggestions. What I'm thinking of would be do a two-year extension, which would be the balance of our term as commissioners, and that could give our citizen services department enough time to work on readjusting how these uh, subsidies are done, see if that's enough time frame for them to eventually pick this up and completely do away with this program. I don't think we should be constantly coming back looking at this. I think the program should terminate in two years, and in that two years, allow citizen services to shift the way we do compensate this senior living facility more in line with the subsidies that we get, I guess, from the state and federal government so that way it would ensure that the apartment complex does get the financial resources they need, just that it would come from a different source than us as a county, since we as a county are so stressed, instead of giving them the money through a tax credit, we could try to backfill that with any programs that are out there. And in two years time, I think hopefully we could figure out a way to do that. And it's, it's an idea I'd love to hear from my colleagues on that concept. That, that's, I guess that's fine, but if the assessment isn't going to change in three years, I would be more apt to, to at least go three, uh, you know, and then, and then take a look at it. I mean, that does several things here. You know, if you lock into something for 15 years, you lock it, and then you forget about it, really. Uh, but if you do it at a more uh, – an accelerated rate, uh, there's a there's a positive here, I think, and Rob has touched on some of those. I mean, we could even do uh, some of the things that he's suggesting, but it, it, if it's if it's if it's a lesser amount of years that we're locked into, it it prompts that and and pokes these folks to really look into it and whether or not we're still in line with the market, the assessments, and that type of thing. I would rather do it that way, um, and I think that makes sense. To, it makes sense to me. Uh, I, I just think you that that had a lot of weight when you said they're locked in for the next three years with assessments. Uh, I think that's a I think that's a good way uh, to look at this. So I, I would I, I don't I, I'm not I'm not a big fan of going more than three. Uh, I think that's plenty. Uh, you know, doing five then. What happens on that year four and five? This, I think this just allows us to be able to look at it or whoever it's going to be to look at, look at it uh, as they move forward. So I'd be good with three uh, and then move on from there and see what see where – that's my do thoughts. We have, do we have a motion? Three years gives us – oh, sorry. Uh, no, three, ahead, years, three years gives us uh, – probably the right amount of time on this. I was going to suggest that anyway. I do like Rob's idea, 15% below market. That is, uh, takes the volatility out of it and really gives some uh, uh, stability, I think, to this whole thing for us. Uh, so I, I, three years is, I, I think, the correct time frame for me. When, when, does, this, when does this end? Uh, again, I'm sorry, I missed it. Is it June? Um, June 30th. June, June the 30th. extension that you gave last year gave them to June 30th of 2021. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, I even hate to suggest this, but uh, I, I've sort, I sort of agree with you, Commissioner Weaver. Uh, you know, perhaps uh, inserting that language uh, where it's 15% below market would, would – keep us in a good spot too but i guess if the assessment's not going up i'm not so sure that that would re really even apply for the next three years w would it rob i was just about to check what the actual percentage is but it's it's very close to that and as i mentioned right it'll be fixed for the next three years so 
over a three year term, I don't think there's any difference there. All right, I'm gonna make the motion that we approve a three year extension renewal of the pilot agreement for the Westminster Bond Senior Apartments. Second. Okay, got a motion and a second again. Fantastic discussion and uh, appreciate all the insight that you all bring into the table. Um, any further discussion, comments? Seeing there no, go ahead, well, I, go ahead. Thank you, I just very quickly want to thank Mr. Jefferson for the research you put into this and the charts and the graphs, that was very informative and I'm very empathetic to the servicing provider community and I'm hoping that this is some sort of compromise that you can walk away with something and we can walk away with something and we'll be very happy with it. So thank you very much for what you've done presenting today. No, thank you all. And I uh, you know, look forward to uh, I continue to work with you and uh, hey, I'll see you in three years. <laughs> okay. Thanks all a lot. All in favor? Okay, 4-0. Thank you again, sir. And Ladies and you too, Mr. Burke. Okay, let's move on to second quarter budget update. The one, the only Mr. Zaleski, still with the minor league football team around his neck. Go ahead. That's weighing me down. All right, uh, so just wanna update you on what's happening this year. This is largely a good news story, and in some ways a very good news story. Um, just want you to hear this though in context of much of what we're gonna be talking about is the result of short-term changes, not fundamental long-term change that we can count on. And again, to remind everybody that COVID continues, we still have uncertainty and for us particularly the uncertainty of what will happen to businesses and jobs before we get through all this. Okay, so if we look at where we've been so far in this fiscal year, we are projecting right now about a $23 million surplus at the end of the year. I'm gonna explain where that money's coming from. Now, if that were to happen, 4 million of that is already planned for fiscal year 23. That's the 1% we build into our op plan every year, leaving about $19 million that would be available for other uses. Before I get to more specifics about what's happening this year, uh, let me tell you what that does for our total unassigned fund balance, the money we basically have sitting on the sidelines waiting for commissioners to make some choices. You currently have about $30 million. Now you remember that was largely because uh, we made choices to hang on to that money when COVID started to give us some cushion, some, some room if things went bad. If we add this 19 million to the existing, that would be about $49 million that we would have in unassigned fund balance. We'll be talking more about this as we go through the budget process, but just to give you a little start to thinking about this, uh, we've talked on a number of occasions about the value of having some money and unassigned fund balance. It gives us flexibility. It reduces our concerns about short-term variations, neither revenues or expenditures. And we've talked about how good it would be to have money sitting there in an ongoing way. So one of the things I'm gonna be talking to you about is taking this opportunity to decide how much unassigned fund balance do we wanna keep just as a matter of practice. And we might be find ourselves talking about something like keeping 5% of our budget, which would mean holding on to maybe $21 million. And, and my suggestion will be that we, we do that with an idea that that is our intent to keep that much money there, to give us the flexibility to handle short-term variability in our budget. Now, if we keep 21 and all this plays out, that leaves another $28 million that would be available. And again, my intent will be to talk more about this later, but just to put the idea out there, there are two things that I think we can look at doing. Uh, one would be to replace 
some of our planned debt with cash, reduce the amount of debt we're taking on, reduce the amount of debt service we're taking on, and um, reduce our ongoing expenditures. The other would be to look at our infrastructure concerns and identify some of the places that we think have the highest priorities and put some more money into our capital budget to make progress on infrastructure. Okay, now back to this year. Uh, property tax, our biggest revenue, looks to be pretty much on target. Uh, we do have some concern looking ahead about a piece of property tax, and that's the personal property re related to businesses. It's not yet clear what businesses that have gone out of business will have on our revenues. And there, there's no way for us to even try to quantify this. So we have a question mark that we know won't be answered until we actually see a change in the revenue. Income tax, as things stand, we're projecting that we'll be about $8 million over budget at the end of the year. Really important, this is largely driven by reconciling distributions from previous tax years. This is not about increasing the line that moves forward into the future. This is about money from yesterday. Recordation, as things stand, we're looking to come in about $6 million above budget. This has been a really big surprise. You know, we actually backed off a little bit of 21, assuming that people weren't going to be shopping for homes. Now that turned out to not be right. But even at that, this has been an amazing increase in, in activity. And, and again, I don't believe we should take any message from this that we will continue at this level in, in the future. Uh, maybe there's been a change so that we're going to inch up some, but there, I don't see any way that we could think that this is going to be an ongoing trend. Excuse me, real quickly. What was yep. the increase difference? Six million, you said. Yes, that right now projecting six million. Of course, we still have rest of the year to see what happens. And then we've lost about two million dollars of revenue against budget from things that are activity driven, where where activities are not happening. So you think about uh, recreation, wine festival, senior um, center. Uh, any place where there was money coming in because of activities has largely been wiped out. But uh, netting all that, we see revenues about $12 million above budget. On the expenditure side, uh, another very short-term thing, we're going to be able to pick up a lot of our transportation costs with CARES funding. So we have uh, a more than $1 million savings in fiscal year 21. Uh, then there are things that happen in, in every year, some maybe more so this year. Uh, fuel savings is probably uh, being driven some by reduced activity. And we have um, salary savings. And, you know, there's, there's actually nothing really interesting here, just a, a, a accumulation of savings throughout the whole organization. And... Um, then we have uh, our $4.4 million reserve for it contingencies remains intact. Um, always want to say until we get through the winter, you don't want to get too comfortable that that's going to be, be left. You know, because we try to budget reasonably for snow removal, but we, we can never budget enough to handle the worst years. And then that's where the reserve will come into play. And then debt service is down 700,000. That's partially because we uh, issued less debt than we had planned for and partially the impact of the last refunding that we did. All that comes up to expenditure side savings of about $11 million. Uh, so I started off talking about the 22.8. That's a combination of the revenue in excess that I just talked about and the expenditures un under budget. Uh, I don't think there's any reason to think that we're not going to come in with a significant surplus. There are still things that could happen that would reduce this. Uh, but I think in the end, those two big ideas that I talked about should remain in play, that we will have an opportunity to create for ourselves 
uh, a savings account of sorts that I think will be a very good thing for us to have. And the other will be an opportunity to either reduce debt and or do some work on our infrastructure. Okay, um, anything that I can go deeper for you on any of that? Everything you just covered, it's only one-time monies, correct? Largely, that's true. Just one, one shot, okay. And next month, we'll be spending more time talking about revenues, and we'll get into a little bit more pulling apart what's what. But, but what you said is the big message here. This is being driven by short-term conditions. Ed, I'm, I'm wondering if some of this one-time money could be used potentially to address the, uh, the waste management infrastructure issue we have, which seems to be an, an ongoing problem. If we could potentially address that, that might be a wise use of that funding. When you say infrastructure, you mean physical changes to the landfill? Yes, sir. Yes, that's certainly a choice you could make. Okay, well, if there's nothing else, then uh, you also have in front of you a capital budget resolution, uh, C21.04. This is to close out a project. There's a uh, little over $720 left on it, and we want to move that to the Rec and Parks unallocated account just to get this cleaned up. And uh, I think I saw Commissioner Rothstein smile at the $720 there. Just want to point out, uh, this is something you might want to think about. There was a time when the budget office had authority in both the capital budget and the operating budget to make changes like this, basically administrative cleanup, not policy decisions, but just taking care of loose ends without having to make this an item to come to the board. I think there's a lot of good arguments for us getting back to something like that again. Uh, if the commissioners were interested in talking about that, we can talk about exactly what that would, would look like. Uh, but it would make our lives easier and it would make it unnecessary for you to ha have to schedule something. I'll tell you, I, I am absolutely uh, interested in that conversation. Um, you know, I've done this uh, in the past in different, you know, venues and different responsibilities dealing with uh, these type of budgets and giving you that uh, ability allows for a much more efficient approach. I'm not sure why that was taken away from you. I'm sure, uh, well, I won't say I'm sure, I, be I would believe that Commissioner Lance and Weaver have much more insight on that because decisions were made in the past. Um, but uh, getting a, a feel for the ability to delegate those responsibilities uh, within a threshold uh, to allow you to be more efficient. I'm, uh, I don't know. I, I'm personally and professionally uh, for that type of effort. Um, Commissioner Wance Weaver, I mean, do you, you have a better understanding from this from the past or what are your thoughts? Well, I actually think that happened before our time. Uh, that, 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 that was taken away back in, well, I don't want to guess. I think it was before, was it before you, Roberta? Yep. Okay. So, yeah, I'm thinking 07, 08, somewhere back in there, six, but I don't know, somewhere back there. I, I remember having this discussion uh, about this before. Uh, may I suggest in the interest of time that we do take this up? and do it uh, during our budget session. Make it make it uh, uh, an item of, uh, an agenda item uh, during our budget discussion to just include that uh, to assist them uh, in any way and put some, you know, put a limit on it or whatever, uh, whatever it occurs there, but maybe we could make that part of our, 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 uh, our adventure that starts in March. I agree. That'd be a good, good way to handle it. Yeah, it sounds great. And to think we are less than 30 days away from March. So, uh, yeah, 
I, I, I think that's, uh, I appreciate you bringing that up, Ted. And, uh, okay, what else you want to talk about? Uh, well, so we I, just need a, a vote to approve moving that. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to go ahead and make the motion that we approve the capital resolution C-2104, close out the Winfield property and remove the remaining funds uh, of $720.27 to the unallocated account for Rec and Parks, 9319. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion with Commissioner Weaver being upset that he wasn't able to second? All in favor? Thank you. Okay, 4 0. Thank you, um, Deb and Ted. Let's make Ted's life easier because he has it tough. Okay. <clears throat> Not sure I want to do that just quite yet, but that's all right. Let's uh, move on to <clears throat> look at the reimbursement from the Maryland 911 board and a request for approval for acceptance of that reimbursement. Scott? And Jack, you are on. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Um, it's my pleasure, but as you'll hear me say later, it's to Jack Brown's credit that we are here to ask you to please accept $107,393.02 of reimbursement that has been uh, requested of and subsequently approved by the Maryland 911 board for reoccurring maintenance costs. And I'm going to uh, digress a little here, Commissioner, and I have to say that there's only one reason that we're uh, able to make this uh, this presentation to you today is because Jack Brown took the initiative to com to uh, review our eligible expenses, compile a, a project, submit it to the numbers board successfully as usual, and uh, in this case, a situation where the county can recoup over $107,000 of expense that we would have incurred otherwise. So I hate to use the word, and Ted, if you're still on here, you'll probably hate me to use it, but it, it's free money in the sense that um, we would have incurred these expenses, but thanks to the, uh, the, the recent legislation related to 911, these expenses are now eligible for reimbursement, and then thanks to Jack's efforts, we have an opportunity to take advantage of that. So we respectfully ask the, the, the commissioners accept the $107,393.02 in reimbursement offered by the Maryland 911 board. And what are you doing with that money again? Did I miss it? Or I'm sorry, what what what's going on with that 107,000? Commissioner, I believe that any the forms of reimbursement like this goes back to uh, and and I know Ted's you here. I believe it goes to the general fund. It, it does not come back to us, Commissioner, like to uh, subsidize our budget, et cetera. It, it it's accounted for. It's properly um, accepted by the county, but I believe it goes back into the general fund and it's used, I guess, through by your direction. It's not like we get that money back. No, okay, so this is th this is getting paid back for maintenance costs that we have incurred over the last however many months. Yes, okay. That, that is, that's exactly what it is, Commissioner. Okay, cool, all right. Well, now we got another $107,000, right, Ed? And the right colleagues that we didn't have before. So now the budget just looks even better. Right? I don't know. I know. Just okay. Do we have a motion to accept this? Yeah, I'll make. I'll, I'll move that we accept the proposed reimbursement from the 911 board. Uh, I'm a little challenged by the two cents, but I'll include that in my uh, motion. Second, and thank you, Jack. Okay. Again. We have a motion and a second. Uh, gentlemen, great job. Any further discussion? Seeing here none, all in favor? Okay, we got four very enthusiastic thumbs up. <laughs> okay, Jack, go Thanks. back to work. Um, now let's talk about the Maryland Interstate Emergency Management Assistant Compact. Revisions uh, that have been made to it and requesting approval of resolution. We still have Scott and Valerie uh, you're on. Thank you again, commissioners. Um, this time I am going to uh, yield to Ms. Hawkins to ask her to, to briefly review what has changed. But with that, let me uh, set the table by saying that the Maryland Emergency Management Assistance Compact has been reviewed and is indicated in a brief. There have been a, a few substantive changes made to it, and it is now officially known as the Maryland Intrastate 
emergency management compact. Uh, and it, it always was an in, in, in trust data within the state, and now it clearly states the same. So with that, commissioners, if I can turn it over to our emergency manager, Ms. Hawkins, and she can review for you uh, what has changed. Um, thank you, Scott, and good morning, commissioners. Um, just a, you can see in the briefing paper, uh, there are several changes that have been made uh, in addition to the name change for this particular piece of uh, legislation. Uh, the original Maryland Emergency Management Assistance Compact, which was MEMAC without the I, uh, was adopted by all of the jurisdictions throughout the state uh, on uh, as of September 9th, 2013. Uh, so the idea of this is not new. Um, the whole idea behind it, its mission is to provide intrastate support to all 26 Maryland jurisdictions to assist in the response to disasters or emergencies by providing a mechanism for those jurisdictions to request and receive help from their neighbors. So basically, it's uh, uh, legislation that allows for all of the participating jurisdictions to get help during times of emergency uh, from their neighboring jurisdictions, or, you know, it doesn't have to be somebody contiguous to us. It could be, we could receive assistance to, from Garrett County, uh, or we could provide assistance to Ocean City. Uh, it's just uh, definitely within the state. Um, the functional areas that can be, uh, for assistance can be provided. It can be fire service, law enforcement, emergency medical services, transportation, communications, public works and engineering, building inspection, planning and information assistance, mass care, resource report, health and medical services, and search and rescue. So any of those types of uh, needs uh, and uh, capabilities, uh, we could request or uh, assist uh, another jurisdiction. Um, so that's the, the way it's been uh, in the past. The changes um, in, in MEMAC without the I, the previous version, a local declaration of emergency was a precursor to being able to utilize uh, that legislation. Uh, that is no longer necessary under MEMAC with the I. Uh, and I'll continue to say it that way because we're pronouncing it, we're pronouncing the acronym the same way. Um, so we no longer have to have a declaration of emergency. Um, so assistance can be provided in both emergency situations and situations uh, such as uh, emergency management related exercises or testing or training. Um, so that's something that we've wanted for a long time uh, in the emergency management community to be able to uh, provide that assistance back and forth for testing and uh, or training and especially for exercises. Uh, so that's very helpful to us. Um, there are some increased requirements uh, for information sharing between party jurisdictions and MEMA. Um, the original MEMAC without the I uh, encouraged that, and it really was a requirement, uh, but this is actually putting that into the letter of the law uh, to make sure that uh, the, the communication goes through and through MEMA and all, all the, the loops are closed. Uh, MEMA is the administrative coordinating body for all of this, uh, so uh, it just helps to tie in some uh, tie up some of the loose ends in the legislation before um, there are some procedural changes that are in, in there that are intended to increase the efficiency of the request process so before uh, the only way to get a uh, MEMAC request going was through MEMA uh, now this new legislation allows the authorized jurisdictional representative from one jurisdiction to directly contact another authorized uh, representative in another jurisdiction to get the process going to basically so basically I as the authorized representative can contact my counterpart in another county and get the process of assistance started uh, and then there's 10 days that is allowed to to do the paperwork back and forth because there is always a cost with assistance so part of what MEMAC uh, addresses as well is uh, determining the offer of assistance from an offering jurisdiction. And if we're going to offer assistance, for example, uh, we put that offer out there. We say this is how much we think it's going to cost and how much uh, the receiving jurisdiction would need to reimburse us in the future. Uh, they decide to accept or not, and then we move on from there. Um, so that's how it's intended to work. We can choose uh, if we or any jurisdiction that's uh, 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 an assisting jurisdiction can choose uh, to uh, eventually ask for, you know, an invoice the other, the receiving jurisdiction for uh, the services or uh, rendered, or we can choose uh, not to. We can say we're just going to donate that uh, assistance to the other jurisdiction as, you know, as, as a neighborly act, 
uh, or anything in between. So all of those are options out there. So uh, what we're asking today is simply for you uh, as the Board of uh, Commissioners uh, to adopt this uh, and uh, the, the MEMAC with the I uh, and uh, just basically create that resolution and approve it so that uh, we can continue to participate in the compact across the state. So with that, uh, hopefully that gives you uh, the background and the detail that you need. But if you have any questions, please uh, let me know and I'll do my best to answer them. Okay, any thoughts? Yes, Commissioner Wentz. Yeah, I just think it's a good, this is something that's, uh, as Valerie said, been working on for a long time. We've talked about it at GMAC. There's another acronym for everybody. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the GMAC, which is the Governor's Emergency Management Advisory Council, uh, fully uh, supports this move as well. And I think it's a great idea. And uh, bottom line, it helps with mutual aid. And that's, that's a good thing. Streamlines that, if you will. So I make the motion to approve Carroll County's participation in MEMAC to include execution of this uh, resolution that we have. Second. Okay, now I got a motion and a second with MEMAC with an I and our participation. Any further discussion? Seeing here okay. none, all in favor? Oh, go ahead, Commissioner. Look, Commissioner. Look, real quickly, Ms. Hawkins, I wanna thank you for your leadership on this resolution. Also, your leadership and briefing us on the weather stuff that comes up. You're right on spot and you're right on time with this us up to date on what's happening especially with the weather it just took place so thank you thank you commissioner okay appreciate that shout out as well uh all in favor <laughs> okay we got 4-0 valerie go back to work okay thank you, we have now Request approval for application submittal for assistance to firefighters grant AFG. And we have, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Mr. Campbell on, and we have Mr. McCoy, and we have Deb Stanford. Okay, Stanford, excuse me. Um, Scott, you want to take this on? Absolutely. Thank you once again, commissioners. Um, by a, as a result of the commissioners, this board's action October 1 of 2020, when you established the Carroll County Department of Fire and EMS or Emergency Medical Services, it included the creation of the first ever Carroll County Fire Department. That action made the county for the first time ever eligible to apply for, and if we're fortunate to receive a, a grant under the Assistance of Firefighter Grant Program. Uh, many of you, and I know Commissioner Lance is personally familiar because I believe his, his department's actually benefited from uh, receiving some AFGs in the past. Um, but this is something that we've always been interested in, but we've never been eligible for because we've never had a, quote, Carroll County Fire Department. We confirmed our eligibility by actually sp speaking with someone that actually staffs the help desk, as it's known, uh, which are either employees or uh, folks of, the, of FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, who oversee this program. Um, specifically, as a result of our eligibility, we thought it was worth developing a, a proposed application, should you agree uh, to allow us to, to submit it, requesting 277 portable radios and 111 mobile radios for the county's fire service. And I will gladly elaborate as to the basis for those and what that involves. Uh, please note, commissioners, that the county has previously purchased portable and mobile radios uh, and subsequently issued them to the fire service. So this is not something new. This is something we have done for years prior to and fully intend to continue to do so now that we have the Carroll County Fire Department. Uh, the radio spe specified in the proposed uh, application are part of a planned future purchase. So it's not that we are proposing to buy these, quote, only because we can do so under the grant. This is something that we would do whether or we would propose doing whether or not we can get it funded under the grant. So uh, I, I need to point out that absent the requested grant funds, if we don't ask for the radios specified under this application, this grant, the county would in fact be responsible to fund these purchases when they are requested in, in the future. So if I can please break down, uh, the 111 mobile radios are a one for one for emergency apparatus 
100% in compliance with as how it's defined as uh, under the AFG guidance, meaning there are some vehicles that a fire department may operate that aren't clearly a uh, an emergency apparatus, emergency response vehicle. So these mobile radios are for, like our fire engines, our rescue squads, our medic units. The 277 portable radios, of that 192 would replace the existing radios that we have that are assigned to what are what are defined as approved riding positions or seated positions. I'm showing my age because back in the day, you ride apparatus, you didn't necessarily have a seat. You rode on the back step, you stood up in the canopy cab, et cetera. Those are all eliminated. Now they are fixed approved riding positions. So we have currently 410 of those fixed riding positions. 325 have a radio, which means 85 do not. They do not have a portable assigned to them or available to them. So of the 277 that we're asking under this grant application, 192 would replace existing. The other 85 are to cover those seats that do not have a radio. And I'd like to stop there if there's any question about their inclusion. And uh, uh, Director McCoy is gracious enough to join us to explain that having a portable radio uh, available to or assigned to every approved riding position is basically a, a tenet of safety, which is the foundation of, of uh, the director's department. And if there's any questions as far as the, the need for or the intent to ask for these radios, uh, outside of this grant application, I'm, I'm sure Director McCoy would be happy to, to field those questions. Mr. Campbell, thanks for this briefing. I'm curious on the financial end of it about the matching funds in the preliminary budget for next year. Would that be in addition to what you had the previous year or would those funds be reallocated from other expenditures you had? Would, would this increase your budget or be within the budget of the previous year? How, how do we finance this? Great question, Commissioner. It would not increase our, our budget. Um, I don't see, um, I apologize, I'm scanning here. I, I, if Ted hears, I, I believe that the intent would be there's already in the, how do we word it, preliminary recommended CIP, a request for monies to purchase radios, not the radios we're talking about here. They're not designated as such. We are not talking about uh, supplanting budgeted funds. We have many other needs for those monies that, that they would be used for. The uh, monies that are already included in our proposed spending plan would more than satisfy the required county cash match 162 245. We would not need to modify our ask or add money to that ask. So, Ted, I, I, I apologize. I don't know the the, uh, the specifics of how that's appropriately done, how our CIP asked that some of those funds would be put in a different fund. No additional money. It's just where it would go to make it eligible to use for the match. Is that even close to correct, Ted? Yes. Um, we, we budget every year for radio replacement. This goes on forever. So um, we were already planning to purchase radios this would provide unexpected funding. I think you both gave excellent answers and reassured me. Is that it for your presentation? Because I'm ready to roll here. Commissioner, I'm, I'm at, at your uh, disposal. If you have questions, otherwise I'll gladly be quiet and listen to your motion. I move that we uh, authorize the submission of an app to the uh, AFG program as presented and fingers crossed, accept the award. Okay, we got a motion and second, I believe I saw. Uh, any further discussion? No, good luck. <laughs> thank you, commissioners and, and Director McCoy and, and Ms. Stanford, thank you both. Okay, let's move on to uh, Rec and Parks with a background check for Volunteers Department of Recreation and Parks. Uh, Mr. Deggett, you're on. Maureen, you're on. Okay, Go for it. good morning, Commissioners. Uh, we are here to seek your approval to award for the contract to conduct background <laughs> checks on Recreational Council volunteers to National Center for Safety Incentives, which is NCSI. And we are, um, this was an RF, 
P. So we formed a committee to evaluate both the technical and the financial capabilities and the of all the potential vendors and NCIS scored highest overall with a fee per check of $15 per applicant. This amount is within the uh, appropriated budget and questions on the project. I'll turn it over to Jeff. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, Recreation and Parks requires background checks of volunteers in certain positions. This would include all Rec Council board members, board members on youth sports programs, head coaches, assistant coaches, and basically any volunteer who is charged with the care or custody of youth or special populations. Uh, we have some amount of funding within Recreation and Parks operating budget each year, which goes towards this expense. <laughs> Rec councils also contribute towards this cost uh, by uh, paying a per registrant fee to the department. We use those funds collectively to pay for these background checks. And as Maureen mentioned and was in the briefing paper, there are no additional county funds uh, required for this. And the cost is $15 per volunteer to complete these checks and they are done on an annual basis. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. How much depth do you go into in a background check? Uh, we're basically looking at state and federal criminal history, any sort of financial information. And one of the nice things about the process that we have set up is we're providing a link to our prospective volunteers. Uh, they will go directly to this company. They will enter their information. They will get the results. The only thing we will see is a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And that's it. So we don't need to get into anybody's uh, personal information or background. And the individuals do have the opportunity if they have any questions or concerns about what comes up in the background check, they can appeal that directly to the company. And then the company would inform us of the outcome. Have we used them before this company? Yes, we have used them since we implemented this policy. Uh, we've had an excellent working relationship with them. In fact, many other counties within the state of Maryland also use this company. With that, I'll move uh, the Board of Commissioners award a contract for background checks to volunteers to NCSI. I will second, second. that. Uh, real quickly, Director Daggett, how much do you annually budget for this type of expense? And do you foresee next year having a savings because of this? We currently have uh, $15,000 per year within our operating budget and county funds to go towards this expense. Uh, the number of volunteers varies from year to year. Uh, the rec councils pay us a per registrant fee. So you're looking at two or three dollars per child who registers for say a youth sports program that goes into this pot along with those county funds. We use that revenue to pay for the background checks. Sounds good. Okay, we have a motion in a couple seconds. I'm surprised we didn't hear anything about Mark Harmon or Gibbs or Ziva or anything like that from NCIS. But uh, it's not the right. It's not the right acronym. It's close. It's close enough. It's just not. It's 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 this much off. Come on, man. You were thinking <laughs> it. Okay, all in favor. We got four zero. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, commissioners. If I, could add, if I could add something real quick, if I had a dollar for every time I said NCIS instead of NCSI, we might not even need that fifteen thousand dollars from you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, and thanks for all you're doing. <clears throat> okay, let's. Uh, that is all the actions for this morning. Let's move into public comment. Do we have public comment, uh, Chris? We had, we had a caller on earlier. They seem to have left. Okay, so we have no public comment. Interesting. I was expecting oh. one. Say again, Chris. No comments today. Okay. So we will move on to uh, uh, admin, uh, open admin. Um, 
We have uh, need approval for minutes on closed acquisition, closed land acquisition on January 28th. I move we approve. Second. Okay, hopefully all have seen. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Okay, got four row. And then also need approval of closed minutes from closed and admin on 128, on also January 28th. Uh, move we approve. Second. Okay, got a motion and second. And all in favor? Four O. okay. <clears throat> Anything for Oak Admin? Uh, real quickly, uh, uh, just a quick update on uh, planning and zoning last night. And in the interest of, of being transparent here, uh, several conversations, very good conversations last night. Uh, I think it's important to get some, you know, uh, some uh, input on what's going on there because they're one of our most important groups. So there was a, a lot of uh, talk about solar and uh, bringing that onto our ag easements. So uh, that group is just going to uh, get more information because it was just the basics last night. So they're moving through that. Um, they, they also went over all the decisions that were made with our comprehensive rezoning, uh, which is good, and a couple questions, but sort of just went right through. Uh, the only thing I was a little bit surprised by, uh, they, they uh, started off their discussion uh, last evening in the meeting uh, about our budget, and uh, specifically as it pertains to our CIP budget. So just for my colleagues' information, uh, they got into some areas that, uh, quite frankly, uh, surprised me a little bit, uh, even suggesting some things that we should do with some of our monies. So as a result of that, uh, apparently there is, uh, a, there is procedures and process in place for planning uh, committees uh, to comment on the, uh, whether or not there is consistency with master plans. And this is not just here in Carroll, but apparently across the state. So I've asked for a, uh, uh, I've asked for a meeting uh, through Roberta uh, with the associated uh, people just to get a little bit more interest or a little bit more information on what it exactly means for planning uh, commissions to uh, talk about budget items. So I'll have more for all of you uh, next week in, in session uh, just to, to let you know. But uh, kind of took me a little bit by surprise when uh, when that. <laughs> when that conversation began. So uh, so that's all that I have. Uh, and thank you. Mr. Wayans, or Commissioner Wayans, I think that was a great segue. What I'm interested in is having a greater understanding through the course of the year what each department is looking at for their budget requirements. And I don't know whether this is the right time. Roberta can correct me if I'm wrong. Whether previous boards had divided up all the different departments and agencies amongst their membership so that they would be the contact point person throughout the year to brief a commissioner on what their budgetary needs are or even policy ideas before they come to the full board, we'd at least have one commissioner in total command of that, that subject. Say uh, Commissioner Wance is assigned to the planning commission or the planning department and that any issues that that department would have, Commissioner Wance would have a full grasp and understanding of it and bring it to us and sponsor it on the agenda. Is that something you guys would be interested in? Because I think it'd be helpful for us throughout the year, by the time we reach the budget, we have individually command of certain agencies and departments instead of just having a general idea about all of them. That's kind of why we served on boards and commissions uh, that we developed that and over the years and we, that's why we rotate through them. So we do have those thorough understandings at that point. But that, that's part of it. What I'm getting at is say, say you, Commissioner Weaver, have citizen services as one of the agencies or departments that you are the liaison with. You could be brief monthly with their minutes of their meetings. Uh, if they have a policy concern, 
they can pull you into it ahead of time with, with their county administrator and get you a better committing understanding of it, not just uh, an external board of commission, but actually dig deeper into our different departments. I think it would be helpful to us in the long term to have a better command and understanding going into the budget process. Because when we get our brochures and our booklets on the budget, we see a lot of numbers, but we haven't had a chance to digest all that information building up to that point. I think in the long term, it would be really helpful for all of us if we divided up each agencies and whether this had been done in the past, not just the commissions, but I'm talking about actual departments that we, we oversee. Go ahead, Commissioner Wentz. Well, now I'm, I'm thinking on this one. Uh, I'd, I'd have to think about this one a little bit further other than just. Right. I, this... I think per personally, I think there's merit to what you're sharing. Um, I don't think uh, it's as necessary. Um, I, I do believe we are close knit enough and our relationships within uh, the directorates are strong. Um, and my, my, my concern is if one is a liaison to one area um, that the others will not engage nearly as much. Um, and I do believe all minutes, all agenda items, I mean, the, the, the commissions, that's really where we get a lot of our uh, awareness um, and engagements um, with, with the directors. Uh, the cabinet minutes are very important, the cabinet meetings and the, uh, the work that they are doing to uh, get more engaged with those um, comments, I think are important. I, I don't think we need to separate ourselves in saying one's in charge of being a liaison to one service or one director and one's to another. Um, I think our plates are full with what we're doing and we work well together. But uh, I, I know what you're saying and there is merit to it and there could be value to it. I just, I don't see it, you know, right now, but that's, that's where I'm coming from. Um, I'd have to, uh, like, I just think more about how we would break it up, but right now I'm, I think we're good. <laughs> I, I personally think we're very good. So well, I'd like to give the example, Commissioner Wance has a thorough commanding of emergency medical services. And I like the fact that he is the de, de, de facto liaison for this board because that's his discipline. And I'm very happy with that. You know, none of us can surmount what he knows about that discipline and he works very well at that. And, you know, and other things, I think like with uh, Department of Public Works and Waste Management, I think it's important to at least have one of us to be more in tune with certain departments and the others to represent their needs to the rest of our board. And I also like seeing that when different departments have a policy idea or change, that they do not have the authority to bring it before our board as non-publicly elected officials, that they be forced to bring it to at least one of us and brief us and bring us up to speed and have us sponsor it onto the agenda. Then when that policy item comes onto the agenda, one of us as a colleague has a much better grasp and understanding to be an advocate on the board. Sometimes I feel like we're looking at department heads and we're, we're receiving information all at once and none of us have a real thorough understanding except, you know, Commissioner Williams is an example of EMS. And I think, if we have someone more on the front end, their deliberations and our debates on the board will be much more thorough and we'll reach better decisions on them. It's just an idea and it's worth putting out there. No, I, and again, I, I, I appreciate it. Um, I, I don't see necessarily the value in doing that by partitioning it out um, and taking personalities of our experiences and, and putting them in uh, I, I, I don't see it. I think, I think honestly, the agendas are our agendas. You know, I'm going to go through the agenda in just a second. And once we go through the agenda, we as a board of commissioners accept the agenda uh, going out two weeks. 
if we do not accept the agenda, we all have the opportunity to say, no, time, this is what we want to do. It's also our due diligence, our work to get with whatever staff it is that's presenting and make sure we are clear in what they're going to be presenting uh, before um, they, they come in front of us. It, I mean, that's on us. Uh, I mean, these agendas are not the staff's agenda. They're, they're ours once we accept them. Uh, once we go through them, that's that's the role we're playing in this uh, when it comes to agendas. As far as the directorates, um, and trust me, a subject matter expert when it comes to fire and EMS, we are very blessed and fortunate to have Commissioner Lance, uh, who has walked the walk, you know. But all of us um, have run organizations and in organization design. So it takes all of us to ensure that fire and EMS or any of the directorates is, um, is well resourced and able to do their job. It's not, you know, incumbent on just one, uh, you know, as far as subject matter expert, I got it, you know, um, but as far as organization, I think it's all of us. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not one for parsing out, you know, uh, at this time, I think we're doing it. I think we're doing it well. I think uh, if you feel we're not doing it well, uh, getting more engaged um, from the cabinet, from the agendas, from each directorate, uh, and I'm not pointing at you, Eric, I'm pointing at all of us, then it's on all of us to move forward and to do it harder. Um, but I'm, yeah, I, I'm not for parsing out the directorates. I, I mean, I don't wanna say I don't have time, but I'm looking at this from a resource management perspective on how best to serve our community. Um, do we have the, the people, the organization, and the money in place to do that? Um, I have questions on that, and uh, I'm gonna be looking, you know, and we've talked about this, processes, procedures, organization, um, overall, but that's on us to do, you know? So that's kind of where I'm coming from uh anybody else lit up no I, I i agree i i i think it's got you've got some merit there eric although i yeah. think we should we i i i don't want to just completely ignore your your thoughts there uh i'd like a little bit more time to absorb what you're trying to do there but i will say i think we need to if if we would do something like that we need to be very careful as well because typically when you know over the last six years and i think dick will agree with me here you know, over the last six and a half years that we've been doing this job, you know, if someone has something that they want to present or or share or what have you, uh, they'll make an effort to come to all five of us. And a lot of our directors and staff have done that. And I just, I, I think that if one person um, is assigned or whatever you want to call that to a department, you have the potential there to, to be a little bit more shocked or surprised by something um, as it pertains to new ideas or thoughts or what have you, because they, they, over the last, again, six years, countless times we've had uh, cabinet and, and directors come to us. Uh, they'll meet because of the open meetings law, and you, know, you don't want to get in trouble there. Uh, they'll, they'll typically use, uh, they'll, they'll meet with two of us, and then they'll go to another two, or they'll go to one-on-one -on -one or what have you. And I believe it's worked well. I believe if we had a bigger organization uh, where where there were a lot of a lot more folks here, that it, your your thought maybe would have some merit. Uh, but I sort of like the way of, of all of us having that global or global look at what we're doing. And Dick kind of said it too. You know, uh, I think it's it, it's it's important for all of us to share any of those thoughts uh, on any of these boards and commissions that we're serving on just as I did today, just to keep you all abreast of what's going on. So while, while I'm not, I'm not, I'm not just throwing, I'm not throwing it out the window, Eric, I, I think it maybe could be something we'd look at, but I think we would use caution moving forward. So uh, just not prepared to go with, I uh, appreciate the idea, but not prepared to make a decision on that today, obviously. Yeah, that's understood. I'm thinking maybe in the future, if, uh, Attorney Burke could look into it and see what the history history of this was or is, 
And one of the reasons I brought it up, because I think when I first was elected, it was Commissioner Wayans who mentioned that in the past that some previous boards had done this. And that kind of planted the seed in my mind about us potentially doing this, going back to something that had been done in the past. And I think ultimately it helps take some of the stress off our county administrator because I'm in, in administrative sciences, you should not have more than seven different department heads answering to you. And I believe Roberta does an amazing job. She does what most people are not capable of accomplishing. She has, I believe, you know, what is it, 12 different directors answering to her. And that's a phenomenal thing to do, to juggle all that around and be successful. You know, I think the reason we are successful as a board with the composition of the way it's set up now in operation is specifically on the shoulders of our county administrator. And I'm hoping that in the long term, if we can develop some sort of process or procedure in line with what I'm suggesting, this is going to help the people that replace us in two years. And eventually when Roberta says she's had enough of this and moves on with her, her replacement as well. And you know, it has merits just like Commissioner Wayans has said. So if Mr. Burke could do anything, research it and have some ideas and maybe come back to us, this is us out there as an idea. There's nothing definitive. What's well, an idea or a seed to be planted? So I tell you, I just sure. r r just real real quick. Um, I don't know what Mr. Burke's role would be uh, in doing anything of this because we we we're the ones who uh, you know figure out what our responsibilities are on the board of commissioners within the realm of being on the board. I mean how we're going to practice and uh you know process information and deal with uh the directorates it, it's on us it's not on uh, uh legal or anyone but us i mean that's the that's the fortunate part that i feel is if we want to make a change we can make a change it's we not somebody else giving us uh you know legal advisement um now i, I will share and I, i'm going to just be very candid about my thoughts on this because I've had uh, chief administrators in the past, whether I call them chiefs of staff or uh, deputy commanders or whatever. Um, and the chief administrator, um, Roberta does not have 12 directorates that just fall under her in my view. They fall under us, the directorates, are responsive to us along with um, the chief administrator. The fortunate thing that we have is a chief administrator to help navigate the information and the processes from the directorates to us to allow us to make decisions. Um, that's where we're very fortunate. Um, but at no time have I ever thought I delegated responsibility on decisions on um, what we are doing within the county to a directorate or to a or to the administrator, unless it's very specific. Um, so, yeah, I and, and trust me, I know much. I do know uh, something about command and control and uh, three to five. You know, um, as far as having a responsibility levels. Um, but that's my perspective. If that's not the right perspective then I'll adjust it. But my perspective, I, Eric, I got it. Don't, don't worry about PowerPoint slides. I'm saying that the chief administrator reports to us, the directorates are also responsible for reporting to us to allow us, the board of commissioners, to make the decisions appropriate for the county. That is not delegated to the administrator or to the directorates unless we are very specific on an action like uh, roads or something like that uh, with DPW. Um, so it, because the administrator's uh, responsibility away from talking directly to the directorates as I do every day, what I do is I add the administrator onto it again to help navigate you know, the information, just like I never um, blind copy anybody or I'm very transparent or, uh, 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 you know, approachable of getting the conversations, you know, because that's important as we keep continue to move forward. Um, so, you know, I, because I've heard, 
you know, you and others have, have made comments about um, chief ex or executors and uh, county executives. They're not, they're, they're zero. There's zero, uh, you know, thoughts of anybody being an executive. We are the decision makers in the county. And I'm very proud to say that. I'm very proud to do that in that responsibility. And I will not delegate those authorities to anyone, you know, uh, you know, because that's why uh, I got voted into office and that's my, that's my responsibility. So um, now as far as where you were going for us working with a directorate uh, that does have merit and I'd like to think more about that, especially as we're moving into, uh, you know, into the budget, into organization design and other things that are on our plate. Um, but that's kind of where my mind is. I apologize, Commissioner Weaver. You had uh, oh, no, I, I was just thinking through your proposal, Maury. I think we do need time to think through this, um, but we have to also be careful not to micromanage. I mean, uh, you know, we have departments, we have department uh, chairman, and I think we have a very transparent government. Uh, and I also think we have department heads that are not afraid to uh, address any of us about a concern they have. Uh, you know, if they go to Roberta, that's fine. Uh, and by the way, she does not walk on water, even though you have her there right now. Uh, but um, she's close if it's frozen. But um, I, I think uh, they... Um, we really have to uh, think through this and it's a fine line of our duties and everybody's duties in here that we are not micromanagers of that, of this uh, whole process. And I, I just need more time to digest this and think through it, I think. So good yeah. idea to, to come up with. I thoroughly agree. I don't want to micromanage anyone myself. I'm not that type of person. I like to delegate, but I do like to get some more insight as the year transpires as to what's going on with, especially with the budgetary needs, because our number one constitutional obligation is to fulfill the budget. And the more knowledge we have in commanding and understanding that budget within the different departments, I think the better decisions we can make. You know, it's frustrating when we get a booklet dropped on us and we're looking at it, and we all have our jaws dropped, and, and there's so many numbers and stuff to comprehend. We don't really see the depth of it. What I'm looking for is potentially each one of us having a better depth and understanding of these departments to be their advocates. You know, maybe Commissioner Weaver could uh, have a better understanding of the Sheriff's Department and that when they talk about budgetary needs in the Sheriff's Department, one of my colleagues would have a commanding understanding of that as a colleague as opposed to someone sitting in front of me. Because I, though I respect and appreciate them, I think my colleagues sitting in the same position I sit in, have a different perspective on their budgetary needs and reflection of what our overall responsibility is. And, you know, this is just a seed planet. It's something for us to think about in the long term, see where it goes. Because like I've said before, in two years, it, two years is all fly by fast and the next boards all come in and anything we can do to be proactive and help them, I think will be beneficial to not only them, but our staff and the county administrator. And with that, I'll just close it. No, I, I appreciate it. And again, that's why uh, I think process procedures, like you and I talked about, putting something in place on how we, as the Board of Commissioners, want to run the Board of Commissioners. Um, and if we can leave a, a something for folks to chew on as they move in, that's great. So, okay, let me uh, move into uh, the agendas for the next couple of weeks. On uh, Monday, February 8th, uh, Mako will be doing a town hall forum with Senator Van Hollen and Commissioner Wentz. And I'll also be uh, calling in on that. Uh, and she'll be talking, I think it's gonna be mostly about the pandemic and vaccinations, I'm not positive um, on that. Tuesday, February 9th, um, 2021 Community Health Needs Assessment Review. Uh, Commissioner Wentz will be attending. And then at 7 p.m., there'll be an Ag Center board meeting where I'll be attending up in Westminster. On Wednesday, February 10th, uh, we have MACO, uh, Land Use Subcommittee, Commissioner Frazier, and the Tax Subcommittee, Commissioner Wance. And then the two of them will be attending the uh, Legislative Committee meeting. Um, again, all of these being virtual. 
Also on Wednesday at 5 p.m. is a Board of Education uh, board meeting. Commissioner Weaver will be attending at 5, yeah, 5 p.m. Thursday, we go into open session, February 11th. Uh, we will be discussing the extension of a state of emergency. Um, we will be going through state initiatives, uh, healthcare, all that kind of fun stuff, legislative update. And then some of the action items, we'll get an update on the Exploration Commons uh, project uh, over at the library. We will be talking the 2022 CTP priority letter from uh, Ms. Eisenberg. We'll then be talking fees, water and sewer amendments, fees with regarding annexation requests, both coming from the planning department. We will get a request for approval to exercise option to purchase um, properties uh, covered by the IPA uh, county pro, uh, county properties through the county program IPA. Um, let's see. We will request approval. There will be a request approval of change order of the Greens of Westminster Stormwater Management Restoration Contract. And then we'll go into open admin. <clears throat> we will have a closed uh, session dealing with land acquisition after that at 1225. Let's see. At 5 p.m., uh, Carol uh, Chamber of Commerce will do their kickoff for Carol Biz Challenge. I will be attending that. And then Commissioner Wance has the podcast on Valentine's Day. On February 15th, uh, in honor of uh, President's Day, the county offices will be closed. On Tuesday, February 16th, is a Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. Commissioner Wance will be attending. And then a Veterans Advisory Council meeting that afternoon. Commissioner Rothstein and uh, Weaver will be attending. Wednesday, the 17th, uh, MACO has its meetings with the subcommittees on land use with Commissioner Frazier, Tax Subcommittee, Commissioner Wance, and then the two of them attending the Legislative Committee meeting. The Community College Board of Trustees meeting will be uh, at the virtual meeting at 4.30 p.m. on Wednesday. Commissioner Wance will be attending. <clears throat> Thursday, February 18th, open session. Typical uh, discussions on state directives, legislative update, and uh, from Ed Singer. And then we will be talking uh, from the sheriff, law enforcement, uh, body worn camera project briefing, where, uh, yeah, Sheriff DeWeese and uh, our state's attorney office, uh, Mr. DeLeonardo, will be uh, discussing the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, body cams. Wow, <laughs> that is all that's on open session for uh, the 18th. I'm sure it will fill up to that. There is nothing scheduled on uh, Friday, Saturday, and Commissioner Weaver has a podcast on the 21st. Okay. Any comments, thoughts on the upcoming agendas? Seeing and hearing none, I need a motion. What's that? I'm sorry, one quick agenda right. item for open admin. Um, so several weeks ago, prior to the holidays, um, the governor issued an executive order that um, um, in the it, out in the community, it's been referred to as a travel ban. It's not really a travel ban. It's just if you travel outside of the state and the local area, then you should get tested or quarantined when, when returning to Maryland. Um, for some reason, I we thought that this was ending at the end of January. It's come to our attention that, that the executive order doesn't end in January. It ends actually when everything else ends, which is at the end of this emergency. So um, if uh, unless, unless you disagree, I'm going to um, notify staff of a, that this does not end and that it would continue. Um, but I didn't want to do that without your 
agreement. Everybody okay with that? Yeah. So we just continue to follow the state. Yeah, I think it's just consistent with everything else that we've done and follow the state guidelines. So until such time as we get different information, I'd say that we continue to do that. Uh, I think it's important anyway. That's best practices because, man, if there's something going on somewhere else, we certainly want to make sure that it's not brought here. Uh, so uh, I would, in the interest of staying consistent with the state, I would say I'm, I'm good, but just me. No, same. I, I think it's a, a consistent message that we've had. And uh, unless there's a difference of opinion, let's just continue. Okay. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to need a motion to adjourn, and then we're going to stick around to go into closed admin once we're off the air. Is there a motion? Motion to uh, make a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Okay, got motion second. Absolutely seeing no discussion. All in favor?